And we're looking good, you'll be in for a fight And we fight pretty good, getting goals is our job And we get goals good, looking good, we are Carlisle United Hello everyone, you're listening to the Brunson Bugle The number one place to get your car night fix in the podcast world I'm Lee Rooney And I'm Mike Booth Two games in and United are still searching for that first win back in League One as they go down to a narrow defeat at Oxford United. We look back on the 1-0 loss at the Kassam Stadium before looking ahead to Wigan Athletics to visit to Brunton Park on Tuesday night. Still looking for that elusive three points in League One, aren't we, Mike? Yeah, but I've seen a little bit of bed wetting, but I think... It's not nothing to get too concerned about uh, yeah. just yet. We'll we'll also be discussing that when we touch on the uh, match yeah. review section. But I, I think I think it might be a little bit of a reality check for a few people. I know that I predicted mid table twelfth or whatever in, in the preseason thing. There's a bit of fun and games going on with that. We always try and be a bit too positive with that, don't we? Really, we try and say, yeah, we really believe in this, and and it was based on us getting a couple more attackers in. If I'm honest. Um, but I think we all knew deep down this was going to be a very, very tough season. You know, I think there's been a certainly in terms of what we're able to recruit. There's been a big eye opener there. I think in terms of how much money we've got to spend compared yeah. to other clubs. So it'd be interesting to see um, a few more thoughts from fans in the next few weeks, depending on what happens. But, uh, but yeah, that's where we are. Um, you've still not been to a game yet this season, have you, Mike? I don't think. Um, it's, no. Oh, no, sorry, you went to Harrogate. Oh, I did Harrogate. get to Harrogate, yeah. In the league. Thanks in the for, league. for reminding me of that. I've completely forgot about that. Sorry, Jeez. sorry. Um, sorry about that. In the league, you haven't been to one. Port Vale's going to be your first. We're going to be, yes. we're both going to be driving down to that thing, aren't we? Because the trains are off. And yeah, to, yeah. To be honest, it's a pain to get to by train anyway. It's a, it's a weird one, isn't it? It's long port. Yeah, it's easy stage. to drive from our neck of the woods anyway. But um, Definitely. But yeah, I mean, I think from what we've seen so far if you compare it to the year that we did go down from this yeah. league a million miles away from that where we were getting battered in our first few games I think you know just keep the faith we'll be alright yeah. yeah 100% well uh, let's uh, get into it before we do though uh, just to remind you for the third season in a row the first, third season in a row the Car United Sports Club London Branch are sponsoring the Brunson Bugle yes the London Branch is a uh, if you don't know about them already, then where have you been listening? <laughs> We've been talking about them every episode for the last three years. Um, they are the uh, basically the, the London branch of the sports club. Um, they basically for exiles, you can join them. You don't, it doesn't matter whether you're in London or the South East. You can be in Berlin, Timbuktu, um, Bangkok. I don't know. I'm trying to think of random places here. I know uh, Kathmandu. Any any random place you can think of, Mike? Where they could, well, you could be? Well, you could be a member in Silith or you know yeah. wherever. I mean, I love that. You've gone from Timbuktu <laughs> and Kathmandu to Sudaf. Pyongyang, maybe? You could be in Pyongyang Blues joining up, possibly. I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe not, no. They, I don't, they don't have internet, do they? But, you know. No, that, that's very true. That's very true. But yeah, the London branch, yeah, they're, they're, they're at all away again. I saw a few of them at the uh, the game yesterday at Oxford, um, selling hit the bar. Um, they, they, they arrange tickets for away games and away travel as well and things like that. And they do a lot of fundraising for the club, some really good stuff. So if you want to find out about them, go to carlalondonbranch.org on the internet or you just grab one of them at an away game when they're selling hit the bar and just have a chat with them. Yep. Um, right into it then, Mike. We've got a bit of news to cover. We've got, we're going we're to have a little discussion about the takeover talks, aren't we, really? A little bit at the end of the news section here before we yeah. do the review of the Oxford game. But let's just bash through some of the news first. First up, a bit of news that broke after we recorded last week. Um, Simo spent most of uh, the summer trying to find a second goalkeeper to provide a bit of competition for Tomash Holy. And on Thursday, he got his man with the arrival of a keeper from one of our League One rivals on a season-long loan. It's Jockel Anderson. This is an interesting one, isn't it, Mike? I actually have to say, because, you know, there's a lot of talk, oh, you're going to get a keeper on loan from maybe the Premier League or the Championship. But actually, I think this is quite a smart signing. What do you reckon? Yeah, I mean, sometimes these are the better signings. I mean, we've had so many loanees from top clubs that haven't been very good. And, you know, I mean, last season we took a player called Ben Barkley on loan from a team in our division. and He did all right, didn't he? So, But, yeah, I think I can't imagine... That he would want to be a number, go from being number two at Redden to being number two at Carlisle. Mm. I think he might be pushing Holy a little bit. 
Yeah, I, th- I think that's the intention, isn't it, basically? Rather than getting in, let's say... I mean, there was a lot of talk that we were after the, the check keeper from um, Liverpool, wasn't there? Yeah. And I think for him, it would have been more a case of he's number two, but maybe could push Holy. I think this is very much one of... OK, Holy starts as number one, but if he slips up, you know, you, you're potentially ready to step in here. Because, mm. you know, he, he, like I said, he, he, we'll, we'll talk about where he's been before, but he's, he's he's got a bit of pedigree about him, hasn't he, at the very least? And, mm. yeah, I, I feel like it, it's a it's a really smart move by Simak to bring him in. I think it's he's someone who can make a really big impact. Um, as you mentioned, like, we, we've bringing players from clubs not quite as high up. I mean, remember when we brought in um, Jack Bonham from Brentford? Mm. And we had, obviously, Shamal George from Liverpool at the same time. Well, Bonham was comfortably the better keeper of the two, wasn't he? Yeah, exactly. The day, so... It goes to show sometimes. Yeah, so Anderson is a 21-year-old Icelandic goalkeeper. The first Icelandic player to play for Kai United if, when he plays. Mm. So that's exciting. Um, is uh, obviously come from Reading is where he's been at for the, I think since he's about 17, 16 or something like that. I think he's been there. Um, but he's got plenty of uh, experience from loan spells. He spent a loan spell at Hungerford Town down that way. But then he's also had three loan spells at Exeter City. Two loan spells at Morecambe and a loan spell at Stevenage. Now, what it is with this is, I think most of those have been the seven-day loans, haven't they? So yeah. Essentially, um, what happens is these days, if you have an issue where you're down to just one first choice goal, well, first team goalkeeper, and they've got less than ten first team appearances under their belt, you can bring a goalkeeper mm. in on loan, but it has to be a seven-day loan. So it's a, and you have to renew that every seven days when you check on the fitness of your other keepers. So I think that's why he's had these spells at both Exeter and Morecambe so many times. But mm. he's got plenty of games under his belt. Um, he's also a full Icelandic international. He made his debut for them in January last year in a 1-1 draw against Uganda. And this is my favourite, well, my two favourite facts here. So his older brother also plays for Reading. But even better than that, his dad is Andres Guffmanson. And he's the 1994 World Strongman Challenge winner. <laughs> I mean... You know, who doesn't love a bit of World's Strongest Man on, on Channel 5, you know? True. Every year. It's one of these things you don't think look ahead to, but you're just flicking through the channels like, oh, World's Strongest Man is on. Let's watch this. Let's give this a but watch. But as well, you know? none of them look strong. They just look fat. But but, but they're, they're, they're clearly very, very strong, aren't they? You know, yeah, like clearly. They're, I mean, when they they're like dragging up, cars and stuff. Cars, those big Atlas balls. Like, they're the ones yeah. that always impress me because they look... Not only are they big and heavy, but they're just an awkward shape to be carrying, aren't they? Especially with the big bellies on them. It's it's really impressive. I hope he comes down to Brunton Park for a game. That'd be fantastic, wouldn't it? <laughs> Having one of the world's strongest men there. Ever. Well, obviously not these days. He's, you know That was, what, nearly 30 years ago now? So, <laughs> well, before he was even born. So, yeah, there you go. But no, fa- fantastic stuff. Yeah, I, I think it's a really smart signing. I think I think Tomash has probably needed a bit of competition for it. I don't think he's been playing particularly badly this season, but it, it's just good to have another... Another person there potentially to, to challenge for that uh, number one spot. There yeah, definitely. Uh, little update on the Warwick Road end situation. Obviously, this was touched on last week. Um, the unsavoury scenes in the game against Fleetwood with items being thrown on the pitch. Obviously, since then, three juveniles have been uh, identified and given interim bans by the club and investigations are ongoing. But the club did announce, didn't they, Mike, that they were going to suspend sales for the uh, games against Wigan Athletic and Exeter City for the Warwick Road end. That mm. suspension has now been lifted, which is really good news. However, yeah. some measures have been put in place. So I'm just going to go through them now while we're here. An increased number of stewards and increased visibility of stewarding, which I think everyone was in agreement was needed. It, it's, it's great to see such a you know, big congregation of young fans in that end, but... Unfortunately, that does mean you're going to have a few idiots in there as well, aren't you? You know, not all yeah. of them are. Most of them are pretty well behaved. You know, there's, there's no issues there, but needs to be sorted. A much tougher and robust stewarding approach to all aspects of fan behaviour, including in-stadium vaping, which we'll touch on in a sec. Uh, very significant increase in searching of fans. I mean, that's going to be very frustrating, especially those who turn up late to games. But that. You know, the only people to blame are those who were lobbing stuff on the pitch at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. Uh, further use of body cameras and surveillance cameras. Far stronger messaging to fans. I mean, to be honest, I think the messaging's pretty strong anyway. And, and and to be honest, if you keep, if you push it too much, it can be a little bit overkill, but that's just my opinion on that one. And increased police numbers, which probably comes with a cost, unfortunately. But there you go. Yeah, uh, yeah in terms of the vaping, there's been a point made about that because obviously the vape, vapes were thrown on the pitch. That uh, Basically, there's going to be a... Increased action taken against fans who vape in the ground. I think if you're over 18 and you're caught vaping, then 
basically I think you will essentially um, be given a warning and told not to do it. And if you do it again, you'll probably be kicked out. Whereas um, I think if you are under 18, you'll have it confiscated and disposed of because mm. technically you can't use them. But mm. it certainly doesn't stop them, does it? So uh, positive steps, I think it's fair to say there, Mike. Yeah, I think so. And I think people have had a glimpse into what could potentially happen if this isn't sorted. Um, yeah. You know, with the suspended ticket sales and stuff. Um, it's it's on the whole positive. I think it could be a lot worse. And I think sometimes if you're to clamp down on football fans and treat them like children, they're more likely to act like children. So yeah. it's good that there's been a little bit of kind of give and take. And hopefully now you know, people are going to put their ideas up a bit. Yeah, absolutely. That, that's what we're really hoping for. I mean, we don't want anything silly to happen and hopefully that that this will be the last that we hear it this season. That's that's, that's the, what we're praying and hoping for. Um, yeah. Right, well, should we talk about the takeover stuff there, Mike? So yes. this is the bit of news that broke um, last week, not long before we recorded, actually, from what I remember, um, about potential American takeover by, or at least investment, possibly, when we were getting ahead of ourselves there, by... Uh, Tom Piatic, who's uh, based out in America. Um, yeah, it's an interesting one. Obviously, he was spotted at the... Well, he was, he was spotted at Wembley, definitely, and he was actually at the games against Bradford as well, and obviously the um, the preseason friendly at uh, Adam Athletic. Um, Simo's now commented on it, so that's really sort of given away that something is happening. He, mm. It was... a. Uh, I did see someone joking and saying he needs to take some acting lessons from his uh, son Dominic, who's obviously uh, an actor <laughs> in the West End, because he wasn't very convincing, saying he didn't know anything about it. But I'm sure he knows limited information at best with that. Yeah, I well, I noticed as well, reading between the lines of what Simo was saying with his so called limited knowledge of it, he seemed to be hinting more along the lines of a takeover rather than yeah. investment. Yeah, that that seems to be what was hinted at, wasn't it? At the... And what he said. Um, I'm just trying to load up the article that um, John Coleman did for this, just so I've got some of the uh, the, the facts uh, here. So obviously, um, yeah, he is a. Where's the details here? Sorry, I should have this up before I start. I shouldn't really, <laughs> but um, but yeah. So he, he he runs a business out in America. It's basically called it's a, uh, a transport logistics uh, company, um, which had a a turnover of I think of 414 million dollars with a net revenue of 85 million dollars for. In 2022, I think it was. Um, Magellan, I think it's called, uh, Logistics. He, he's very... He's an well, army veteran, isn't he? I think he was involved in Desert yeah. Storm during the uh, the Gulf War. Um, mm. They're very much into sport, though, aren't they? That's the thing that stands out for me. They're not people who are... He doesn't... He's, he's not an adventure capitalist, I think it's fully fair to say, is he? Essentially, no. he's a very big sports fan. I mean, in terms of commercial... Uh, partnerships. They've got one with the American fo- the NFL football team, uh, the Jacksonville Dag- Jaguars, also involved in minor league baseball team, the Jacksonville Jumbo Shrimps, which what a name for a team that is. <laughs> Interesting credit. Uh, yeah, basically, I think to say baseball, yeah, baseball team. Uh, the Ooh. professional ice hockey team, the Jacksonville Icemen, and also gets involved in the annual college football game, the Tax Slayer Gator Bowl. Oh, they're just incredible <laughs> names, aren't they? Just it's something yeah. else, isn't it? It's it's brilliant. But he, he, he clearly, you know, it's a family business. His family are involved in it. His son Tom Junior was at the games. I think he posted some things on Instagram that have disappeared off his Instagram now. I think it's fair to say. Mm. So it's a shame, really. And, and look, I know fans are getting very excited, but there's a few people tagging his Twitter, the Twitter handle of his logistics company. Yeah, Stop that it's just stupid. I know you, yeah. you, you. I know you think you're being funny and stuff, but you're not really. It's just not funny. But there you go. Um, yeah. What, what's your thoughts on this generally, then, Mike? Because I mean, look, we've we've all been crying out for extra investment and takeovers down the years, and you know, people get a bit funny when Americans get involved because they think they don't understand soccer, as, as it's called, over, you know, mm. over there, and you know, they think they, they're just going to come in and change everything. But there's some good examples of American owners over here as well that have done decent jobs. You know, everyone looks at Crawley and thinks that's a bad one and stuff, but I'm yeah. sure there's a couple of others that are actually quite decent and, 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 you know, generally let people locally get on with it, don't they? they? As long as they have oversight of the whole thing. So what's your initial thoughts on it? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think if they were to sort of take over or whatever, they wouldn't be sort of judged during execution and they would have people in place to run you know, the day-to-day aspects of the football yeah. club. Um, it, I mean, it's it's exciting. I think if if you wanted to put Carlisle in the shop window and sort of say, right, we're going to take these people to two games 
I think you would have taken them to the Bradford game and the Stockport game last season. Yeah. Uh, so I think they've probably, hopefully, seen what this football club can do and what it can do for the community. Um, and as well, you know, we've seen quite a lot this summer, a lot of the links uh, with businesses in the club. Uh, that's really sort of gone up a level. Um, so I'm hoping that they, they sort of see the best in us and if they're... Um, should we say, oh, what's the word? If their intentions towards us are, are good, then, mm -hmm. you know, Andrew Jenkins isn't getting any younger and it's maybe uh, time for fresh blood. Yeah, I 100% agree. After that, 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 I think you've probably summed it quite well there. I think you have to be cautious on these things and the club have been very cautious on any investment down the years. I mean, after the, especially after the Aya Kurdi fiasco, that, I mean, that was just... Just a ridiculous mess that wasn't it really? This, yeah, this and I mean that that for me that took way too long to suss that this guy wasn't sort of what you want near your football club. Yeah, and to be honest with this one, it's only taken us you know fifteen twenty minutes of Google searches to realise. All right, this seems to be the real deal. This guy seems to have yeah. a bit of money. Look, we we don't want him to go out and sign players on ten grand a week for us. <laughs> At the end of the day, no. What we need is probably a little bit of an injection to keep ourselves in this division and keep ourselves stable. But it's things like a new training ground and improvements mm. around the ground. That's what's needed at Brunner Park yeah. as much as anything. I think you get a decent training ground there, it makes it much easier for Simmer to attract players, doesn't it? Yeah, definitely. That, that's that's 100% what we want. Obviously, the concern in all this is the the debt. That yeah. is something that's, 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 that's going to be a concern, isn't it? It's, it's still hanging over. It's, it's, what, nearly 3 million? I mean, look, the other debts, the Pioneer... Pioneer have just announced a five-year extension on their sponsorship of the mm. Andrew Jenkins stand. I think we can probably put two and two together there and get four, can't we, to work out what that's done in terms of the debt, which is a good thing. Mm. You know, that, that's that's good of them. You know, they're they're sorting out. It, it's an easy solution for them. Yeah. Doesn't take any money out of the club. Does means they get effectively their money back through a sponsorship deal. Great, really, really yeah. works well, doesn't it? Um, but really that needs to be sorted pure pay needs it it sounds like talks have been there was some talk wasn't there they'd they come to the table finally and were, were interested in talking about sorting the debt out which seems to have been around about the time the americans have shown interest so maybe you can put two and two together there mm -hmm. i don't know but they really have to step up here don't they and, and play their part in helping because look that's the only way they're going to get at least some of their money back from this isn't it yeah definitely but i mean you know if the pr techs have money. I'd rather they put three million into improving this club than putting it into Philip Day's back pocket. But at the same time, that debt sits there, and if it gains interest, that comes an issue and oh yeah, cause problems. So mm. even clearing a, a, a big chunk of it, and, mm. and look, at the end of the day, that's the best way for them to get their money back, isn't it? But, but the elephant somewhere. in the room for me that nobody seems to mention is: Does Andrew Jenkins not have three million quid? He may well do, but also his sons are due a lot of inheritance from that probably at some point. So I can't really blame them for looking and thinking, I don't really want that money spent on that. And, you know, football clubs always have debt. I mean, look, you look at the thing that um, Kieran Maguire from the, the Price of Football put out the other day, didn't he? And compared to pretty much every club in League Two a couple of years ago, our debt was tiny. Mm. <laughs> like, you have some clubs that had £30 million of debt at League mm. Two level. Mm. And I know some, some of our fans scoff at it, but he says, but... Our debt was at a fairly manageable level. Mm. Football clubs don't generally get loans from banks because they're no. risks. They're too risky. So they have to get loans from companies usually or their owners and things like that. So we had to go to, to them and it must have reached a point where we couldn't just couldn't loan that money from Pioneer anymore because I'm guessing Andrew's sons just put the phone down and said, no, <laughs> we don't want to be losing money. We've got a business to run here, and, which mm. is fair enough. So I, I don't think the likes of Jenkins go are that cash rich. I think that's the problem. It's, it's very much business rich. And look, yeah. the company that this fellow owns is far, far bigger than Pioneer. That, that's just that's just the reality of it, I think. So it, I, I get what you mean. And I get a lot of people like, oh, you know, we want the owner should do it. But it, in reality, it doesn't work like that. And actually, I'm pretty sure he's probably stepped in and put a bit of money in over, over recent years as well when it's been needed for you know, little shortfalls and stuff like that. So mm. he's, he's written off plenty of debts in the past as well, to be fair. This is just a the big whopper one, isn't it, that we just need to get cleared? Yeah, and that's the thing. You know, you mentioned a lot of clubs are in debt, but really a lot of them, I mean, like when we were in debt to Fred Story, 
it was like kind of like no interest like mm. you just you owe me money but it's fine don't worry about it and then he eventually wrote it off didn't he so yeah some clubs are in should we say uh manageable perfectly fine and reasonable debt and other clubs are in uh very concerning debt but uh we're not quite sure what the pure pay debt is on that scale. I, I, I think at the moment it's fairly manageable. I don't think that they're, they're ever likely to want to put us into administration because that just causes problems for them. Mm. It means they probably don't get a chunk of their debt back. And if the club loses 12 points and gets relegated, well, the club's getting less money and it's harder for them to pay off the debt anyway. Yeah. So I think I think we're probably closer to the more manageable level. We're certainly not in the ridiculous ones where you look and mm. think, how on earth are they ever going to pay any of that back? I don't know, like you said, some of it goes to owners and things like that. But um but yeah, it it's I just feel like that that that, that is we really need pure ball pure pay, sorry, to play ball on this. I hope that's the case. Uh, you get the impression that this is all seems to have come about round about the same time, these things, which, you know, seems mm. to suggest that something's on and there's all kinds of rumours that things have been agreed and the EFL have approved takeovers and stuff. Well, there's nothing out there yet. And the club, understandably, are being very quiet on it. They're being very cautious because these things can go wrong, can't they? So Yeah, and I think if something had happened, we'd know about it. And I, I, want, I want to say as well, because I've had people asking me, oh, has, has Dan said anything about this? Like, Dan is very true to his role and he's not blabbing details to anyone. He won't, he won't, say, he won't, say, he won't tell us. And yeah. and, I, I, and that was, I should say, that was my decision on last week's episode to say to, and he would agree with it anyway, we don't talk about it because you're vice chair of kiosk and he was like, yeah. we, just, we can't, I can't, I'm not going to tell you anything. So that was very much it. We are basically, we, we took him out of the equation on this and that's why I decided we'll do it on Sunday when both me and Micah are on the recording. it makes Because we can easy. say what we want. <laughs> well, within legal reason, yes, we can. But um, but yeah, I think we're, we're sort of both in agreement that this is, this is quite exciting. It could be something really good and really positive and it's riding on the crest of the wave of, you know, what, what good has come before and if it means things like this money comes in, he's like, right, you can spend a little bit of money on building a roof or like a permanent fan zone in the car park. You can mm. spruce up some of the bars. You can, you know, do a few little bits around the ground just to make it more inviting. Stick a roof on the waterworks and start sticking away fans in there so you have the fully stand for seats. Because mm. that's the thing that drives me a bit mad. Like, so at the moment, we're sticking the away fans in that thing. Well, I, I personally would rather... we. I know some fans are a bit funny about this in terms... Of, I'm getting it off on a tangent here, but, you know putting fans behind both goals. You don't want to put the away fans behind a goal. I, I'm happy mm. with it. Stick seats mm. in there, and then that way they've got the seating that's required. Mm. And let our fans have the, the stand, the whole East stand, and you can, because mm. we could easily sell out a lot of these big games. Mm. The problem is we run out of seating tickets, don't we? Mm. So, yes. But anyway, I think we've pretty much covered it there. We'll, we'll, we'll keep an eye on that over the next few weeks. But the general feeling amongst us is, and generally fans is cautious optimism, I think, about this. Is yeah, I say? think... You know, been pessimistic all your life isn't is quite a miserable existence. I've been there, done that. It's it's nice to have a little little bit of hope that things can hopefully be uh, be good. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely right. Uh, before we get on to doing the match review for the um, Oxford United game, uh, where Mike, I think you'll be asking me the questions of the because obviously I went yeah. to the game really, so you can you can quiz me a bit on it. Uh, got to give a shout out to the youth team. Um, fantastic start to the season. Obviously, last week they won five mm. one at home against Wrexham, and they followed that up with a four one win at Walsall this weekend. Robbie Swinburne got a hat trick, and uh, the other goal was Romeo Park. I think scored a goal in pre season, didn't he? For yeah. the uh, for the first team at Gretna. So fantastic, so really good start because I think they had a they had a pretty tough pre season. I think from what I remember, they lost probably I think about seven or eight, five or six games. I think out of the eight, I think mm. they played. But they played some really good teams, and I think it's done them a lot of good. So, really good. Hopefully, there's some really good young players coming through there again, and we can uh, get a few of them into the first team squad. Right, time for the match review section. Mike, Oxford United one, Carlisle United nil. <sighs> this was just a bit of a. I mean, you look at the stats. You think Oxford had quite a few chances, you know, whatever. But neither side really threatened. It wasn't a particularly great game of football. Mm. Um. Just a bit frustrating that it's the same problem that we've seen during preseason and into the first couple of games, isn't it? It's the attacking threat where we're being let down at the moment. Yeah, I mean, for me, ever since Simpsons come back, we play best the best football when it's three five and two strikers. But yeah. that's something that we haven't been doing this season. Yeah, 
it, it, it is somewhere that's sort of it's a gaping hole in the squad, isn't it? In terms of uh, attacking options, I think at the moment mm. it's fair to say. And there's, there's issues there in terms of is Joe Garner up to starting games and playing full ninety minutes and more? But not full ninety minutes, definitely. Can he start games? There's a big question there. Sean Maguire getting his fitness up. Obviously, this weekend wasn't a fitness issue. We know now, but you know it's it's a case of getting things up to speed and. It, it might be a case of we have to face a bit of pain in the opening month for two before we get to the positives of getting forward again, which is difficult because it means then we're playing catch up and chase, aren't we? Yeah. But that kind of feels like where we are at the moment. Um, I, rem- I remember listening to something with Alan Kerbishley years ago, yeah. and he basically said that when you're a team that's sort of fighting the drop, your aim for the first five games should be five points, like a yeah. point per game. And then you want to sort of start picking up wins against the teams around you. So, you know, we're not a million miles off that five points, five games scenario. Yeah. So, we need to get, get a win and get another draw with there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Tough, but, but there you go. Hopefully, start on Tuesday night. Um, line up for this one um, four changes once again for the Blues from the team that started at Harrogate. I think we all expected changes, didn't we? But yeah, in yeah. terms of the team that changed. Um, Back Guy Huntington and Edmonton came into the starting eleven in place of Ellis, Barkley, McGeek, and Plange. Of those who dropped out, McGeek was the only one not on the bench. I think there's an injury issue there, I think Simo yeah. said after the game. Uh, and obviously Moxon and Maguire also dropped off the bench due to uh, illness and a family issue respectively. So Sean Maguire wants a family issue. Hopefully we send him all the best wishes and hopefully that's sorted soon and Definitely. you know you can you know it's all good for him. Um Oh, Moxon, not the dead leg, but it was an illness. And all our sources suggest that, I mean, Simo is very much saying, you know, people put two and two together and get five on this. It, it's not a, a... I mean, I've seen some people suggesting he's on strike and he doesn't want to because he wants to get a move. It's absolute nonsense. Mm. All our sources tell us that there was very much an illness issue, wasn't there, basically. So I think we should have to yeah. respect that. Well, because from what we've heard, it's like gastroenteritis yeah. and he's wound up in hospital. I, I've had it before. To end up in hospital has got to be pretty bad. But yeah. as well, when he's over it, he'll have probably lost quite a bit of weight and he yeah. might not be quite up to it straight away. Yeah. Well, the suggestion from Simo was that he, he came back into training, did okay, but Simo didn't seem convinced of how he looked and thought, mm. Mm, is he fully fit? And then he goes home and he's been... He's tried to eat and he's been sick again. So essentially, uh, you're not coming down. We're not risking it, which is common mm-hmm. sense. Let him recover over the weekend because the Wigan game's an even bigger one. To get a win at home would be even bigger. I think you accept away from home. It's going to be tough at times this season. But mm. the home games, you want to try and stay unbeaten for as long as you can, don't you? Um, so yeah, that was the how it was in terms of the uh, squad. <sighs> in terms of chances in this one, Mike, there's not much to talk about. You know what? Because no. Look, we had eight shots. None of them were on target. And off the top of my head, I'm trying to think of one where we even got close to making the keeper make a save, and I'm I'm really struggling. We played some nice stuff first half, to be fair, but it's just nothing there. And even Oxford, I'll be honest with you, I wasn't that impressed with Oxford at all. Um, mm. They had three shots on target. Two of them were shots straight down in Holy's throat, which he held very comfortably. The third, obviously, was the goal. And the goal, have you seen this on the, the highlights yet? Yes. I've, so I've, we got, were, I've got to say, the pass for it, I've, I think, was brilliant, to be honest. It's a great pass, to be fair. Now, with this goal, right? So, we we are on the opposite sides of the camera in the in the away end. You're in the sort of... As you look, as the camera looks, we're in that stand opposite, but we're in the very far left end of it. So, we had a perfect view behind us of the shot. So, what happens is the ball comes over the top. For, for me, Huntington was having a bit of a go at Lavelle. Mellish tried to track the runner and come across and cover, but he just did, was never going to get there on time. Holy comes out. I think what he's doing, he's trying to come out and shorten the angle or shorten the options and say to him, go on, you try and lob me because I'm six foot nine, I can easily mm. get to it. And what Harris does is, I don't think he even meant to do this. I think he's just not caught it properly. Mm. He's almost scuffed it. Well, not scuffed mm. it, but he's like, only just caught the ball and it's completely caught Holy out. And, could Hurley do better? Maybe, but I think I'd blame the defence a bit more than him. It yeah, just, I'd never blame it, the keeper on a sort of one-to-one situation. Yeah, it, it was a it was a horrible one thing because he like Hurley's done the right thing, thinking he's going to try and lob me here. And what what Harris does is he just side foot it and it it dribbles in in the end. And I I think Harris is a bit embarrassed at first. So like, oh god, I'm, this is going to miss, and then he realised, oh, it's going mm. on target. Great, it's in, and he gets his goal. And 
there was never a feeling after that, you know what, we can get back into this. We, we were sitting there at the game and thinking, yeah, I'm not too sure really. I should actually say, actually, before we go any further, um, I, I was supposed to be going down with our good friend Johnny to the game. Unfortunately, he was ill, so he couldn't make it. So I put a little uh, play out on Twitter to anyone who wanted to share the lift down with me. I was happy to drive down and pick up on the way. And I got a message from uh, Kevin Armour, father of Jack. So I got lift down with Jack Armour's dad to the game. Lovely fella, really lovely fella. I'm, I'm presuming he listens to the show because he follows the Brunton and Bugle. I didn't actually ask him. That's a really stupid thing not to ask, wasn't it, really? <laughs> but but um, I had a really good crack with him, really nice. And he, he talks about how much Jack loves playing for the club and you know just how good Simo is as well. It was really, really good chat we had. And, um, and yeah, um, sat with Greg and uh, our usual crew as well at the game. So just there's just a feeling of around us of like ah, we're not getting into this now are we that 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 goal just kills us and mm. we never look like we were going to concede other than that you know we, we they got in a couple of times but we generally got some good blocks in and it was it, it was fine it just there was a feeling of like attacking wise there's some nice play but we're just not quite there are we yeah and it's almost a little bit of a hangover from we had a spell at the back end of last season didn't we where we just couldn't really score goals um, and it is a bit concerning but yeah for me like I say we we need two strikers I think you touched on it in last week's episode saying that Gibson and McCalman in the same 11 kind of get under each other's feet a little bit you're right I, I, I put, I've put this as a talking point here again today I think mean, there's a big question about this can you play those two in the same team in this formation at the very least anyway, you could maybe in a 4-3-3 if Gibson was one of the wingers. But in this formation, Gibson's playing effectively as an extra striker. Now, Gibson had a good game, actually. Second game in uh, in league games, he's looked really good. Probably been our best player in Mm. both games. Maybe Callum Guy actually may be challenging for that. But decent game, but he's constantly coming deep for the ball. He's using it really well. But once he comes deep, Edmondson's then totally isolated up front. Edmo worked really hard. He won plenty of the ball, but he had no one up there to pick out or lay off to or anything like that. And it just got a bit frustrating in the end. And yeah, McCallum's taken up similar areas to Gibson when Gibson's coming deep for the ball. So there's a really big question to be added, which we'll probably touch on in the preview section of which one do you play? You know, because mm. I don't, I'm not sure you can play both. Well, I think based on form, you'd be playing Gibson, to be honest. Yeah, Alfie played fairly well in both games, to be fair. But I just, I just feel like Gibson offers that little bit more going forward. Um, yeah. yeah. So as I said, Mike, I'll say I was at the game, you weren't. So if you want to fire away and ask me anything based on some of the talking points I put in there, just feel free. We'll have a little discussion here. Yeah. Well, I mean, you've got down. We need attack and reinforcements because I think in terms of strikers, we've got Maguire, yeah. we've got Edmondson, yeah. But who else is really a Luke Planch came on as a sub in this game, and I don't. I, I've just got to keep saying I'm just totally unconvinced. He, yeah, he's starting to reek of 14 appearances, zero goals, mm. and a loan to Bromley come January. <laughs> that, that's what he reeks of, and that sounds harsh, well, it, but I, I'm just not seeing it at all. It's funny you should mention him. Actually, I played seven aside on Thursday night, and there's a lad there who's a Derby fan, and uh, I was saying, oh, like you know, Luke Planch was good for you lot. He's like, he wasn't. We absolutely pulled Palace's down, Palace's pants down, getting a million quid for him. Like so, I think it's so one of those ones where because he'd been in Arsenal's academy bit as well before that. I think people may presume there was a real superstar, you know, someone who could be really good. And Derby threw him in, didn't they? Because they were desperate yeah. for players at that point. And I just I, look, we want him to come good. Like you we know, do, we don't of we want do. to needlessly jump on his back. But but I'm just not. I think it, like, if you put in effort, you cut yourself a bit of slack and he doesn't seem to be putting in the effort so he's I don't I wouldn't say he didn't put in effort I, I think he got a bit frustrated and again he's still got this habit of you know running down blind alleys and not releasing the ball quick enough he needs to he needs to realise he's not playing under 21 on top balls very quickly because mm. I'm not being funny but if he if he was coming in raw and he'd never played men's football before I'd maybe accept him go fair enough he's finding his feet but he had a loan spot at Lincoln last season He's mm. played for Derby at championship level. He should realise that you can't do that. Mm. The Lincoln fans were pretty brutal in their assessment of how poor he was for them. You're starting to see why. Because he just mm. he offers nothing at the moment. And he's... There's one point yesterday where he had the ball. This was about, was it the start of injury time or just into injury time? And he got the ball and he he, he dribbled inside from, from the right and he had the ball. And I thought, right, 
lay it off to someone and then get into the box. And he took a left-footed shot from 30 yards that dribbled wide. It's like, what are you doing? Why are you doing mm. that? Mm. This late in the game when you're 1-0 down, it was just mm. so wasteful and so frustrating. And you could see two or three of the players really frustrated when he did that. Because they mm. kind of think, just keep the ball. Use mm. it better. Mm. It's just, yeah. But like you, t- you touched earlier, you're saying like, we played good football. Would you say that our tactics were more keep it on the deck? Yeah, I, I genuinely think, if you look at the stats, mate, right? Look at the stats I put up in there, right? Mm. Past success, 65%. At times last year, we were struggling to get to 50 in some games, True. which was fine because we were very direct. Mm. That has been consistently over 60 since the start of the season. I think it was 70 possibly for the opening game. So that's definitely improved. And actually, yeah, we, we broke really well down the left. And that was because, you know, you had Mellish, Armour and Gibson all linking really well. But then when it comes to putting the ball in the box, there's nothing there. And, and Menish got in two or three times really well in the first half. Mm. But then when he gets into the box, and sometimes John, Big John is just a case of just fire it in there. But he didn't have much choice because there wasn't anyone in there. There was no one taking a gamble. There was no mm. there was no Christian Dennis in there. I hate to say it. But, you know, he'd, would I say, we, look, I think we probably could have done with him for half a season at the very least to settle ourselves mm. in. Dennis, it's frustrating. We couldn't justify giving him a two-year deal. I totally get that. Mm. On the flip side, we could, we could also have done with someone like Amari Patrick to bring the ball forward a little bit more in games. That, that's where we're maybe missing a little bit as well. Yeah, it's it's you know we don't want to hark back to players who've gone a bit, but yeah, we we, we played nice stuff. We first half I thought was as good as we played this season, probably better than we played against Fleetwood, but without that final pass or whatever, and you could see their fans getting a bit frustrated and, and nervous because mm. uh, the the possession stats there suggest that. Oxford dominated, well, not dominated, but they had 57 to our 43. First half, I'd be interested to see what they were because I'm pretty sure we were on top in terms of that. I'm, I'm definitely going to quickly check this while we're doing it because you can look that up on whoscored.com. But I'm I'm fairly certain we were on top in terms of possession first half. And you went to the break, right, okay, we just need to sort things out, maybe get that extra striker on a bit earlier and we can have a go. And it didn't come. And you look, I'm just looking at the subs now. When did we make the subs? <laughs> 80, 87, 70 with Gibson on for Butterworth. I feel like Simo could have been maybe a bit more proactive with the subs there. Mm. Getting some how, how, how did Butterworth look? I can't make my mind up on him. I don't mm. know what he is at the moment. I think there's, yeah. you see, flash of the quality, and he's, he's, he's fairly good on the ball, you know, in terms of his passing's not too bad and he can dribble the ball a bit, but is he a striker? Is he a winger? I, I, I think, in terms of his ability, I think he could be our sort of advanced striker that an Edmondson could flick it on to, in terms of what he his attributes are. Maybe. Maybe. Um, I'm just looking at possession here. Possession was even worse for the first half, pretty much the same. So mm. I'm surprised. That, I, I thought we were well on top in terms of possession first half. But um, yeah, maybe. But his goal scoring record suggests not. I kind of, I don't know. Is he a winger in a four-three-three? Maybe more. The suggestion mm. seems to be he can play as a number ten, but we don't really play with a number ten in the same way that mm. you might like in a four-two-three-one. I, I, I don't. I, I think there's a player there. I just, I'm not convinced how he fits into the way we play at the moment. That, that's, mm. that, that's what worries me a little bit. Um, and I, how would, how would you say that the midfield like set up? So, like, it was someone at the anchor of it. Was it kind of more of the box? Was it? It was well, very much. Gibson was supposed to be playing as a striker and just dropping deep and drifting yeah. when he needed to. So it wasn't really him in midfield, it, but effectively he ended up dropping into midfield quite a lot. Mm. Um, in, in in terms of mid, the midfield, Guy was doing a usual anchoring job, and he had a great game. To be fair, he had a really good game, and you can see he he's going to be so vital to us this mm. season. And um, I'll be honest with you, the game passed Taylor Charters by a little bit. Mm. He really didn't. He could not get. He, he couldn't find the space to to, to receive the ball. Did he a little just, bit of Harrogate as well. It was just a bit. There's still some nice touches there. And you can still see it, and his set pieces mm. were fairly good. But it's kind of that's an, actually another thing that really annoyed me. Set pieces. We had a couple of free kicks in good shooting positions, and we opted to Callum Guy just to dink it in. I'm like, mm. have we not got anyone else in this squad who can have a a shot other than Owen oh, Moxon? Mm. I mean, Jordan Gibson likes that little knuckleball, doesn't he? He likes to try that. Why yeah. not try him? Why not try Taylor Charles? Why not try even Jack Armour taking one, maybe? Mm. That that really annoyed me. That's, that's a little bit of a tangent. But yeah, Charles, I suppose, I, th- I think was supposed to be a bit further forward than... 
Charles didn't think, seem to know his role. Because I found it's hard to tell what mm. people's roles are, which isn't always a good thing, really. Yeah, I feel like Moxon and Guy tend to sit a bit deeper, don't they? And then you've got Alfie yeah, normally. sort of playing as number 10. But mm. it, it just didn't quite work that way. Yeah, it was a bit... It was a bit infuriating at times, if I'm brutally honest. It, it, mm. it just... There was times as well, I think, not having Moxon there was a big loss for us. Because yeah. Moxon, he... Um, you know, he's a, a decent player, not just attacking wise, but also defensively. Mm. That's why he's really, really strong. He, he and he he's, and he keeps he gels everything together. He's yeah. like the missing Absolutely. piece of the jigsaw. Isn't I'm it? not sure Taylor Charters is quite at that yet, and I'm not sure mm. if Taylor Charters even that's his role. I kind of feel like Taylor Charters actually is a bit better just in front of the front two, a bit further mm. forward, picking those passes out. Moxon plays it a lot deeper, and actually that caught us out a couple of times. They they bypassed our midfields. On a couple of occasions, mm. and suddenly, Mellish was Mellish got very exposed at times in this game. Long, who's played at right back for that, he's an excellent player, really, really like looking, very pacey, and he caught him out a couple of times. And I don't think it was Mellish's fault necessarily, because Mellish we know has to push forward, but you always have Moxon or Guy there scanning, ready to, to pick up the pieces and be the mm. ones covering. And because mm. Guy was pretty much doing that on his own, mm. that's why Mellish got caught out in armor as well a bit more on the left. So, it, I think. I think it just shows how important it is we keep all the mocks and we just ignore any bids. If he goes yeah. for free, you know, if he goes for free next summer, fine. If it keeps mm. us up, who will care really? If we if we if we miss out on quarter of a million pounds, or whatever it is, a black pill offered. Yeah, and that, and that's the thing with Moxon for me is that there's numerous ways him leaving the club can come about. Like he could, yeah. the, we could have this ongoing transfer saga all summer, and then he leaves on deadline day. And we don't have time to get a replacement. I won't be yeah. happy with that. If he plays out of his skin, wanting to get a really good move next summer, and leaves yeah. us on a free and gets that good move, I take my hat off to him. You know, thanks. Uh, see you later. Um, if he downs tools and thinks, "Oh, I'm off in the summer anyway," and I'm can't can't see that one happening. No, no. Slayers, but no. if if it's that, I wouldn't be happy. You know, if he's going to leave the club and he's going to sort of play well for us as long as he's still here, I'm, I I can't knock him. No, absolutely. I think that's the key thing with this, isn't it? Um, yeah, anything else you want to ask about, really? It's, it's, um, it's a weird game because there wasn't really much to talk about in terms of the actual action. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll reel out really. the 60 second reviews and we'll yeah, like, riff off actually, them. Yeah. Right, so let's do the six second reviews. Uh, we'll start with Regan Thompson. So Regan sending his first of the season. He has told us that he's, he's retired his catchphrase for this season. Ooh. And since then, we've we've not been particularly good. So, Regan, <laughs> if we win a game, you're going to have to bring it back, I'm afraid. That, that's the rule, so there you go. Yeah, right, so here's Regan's, here's Regan's six-second review. Um, yeah, it was obviously disappointing to lose when he's an error like that. Um, I'd put more blame on the defence than I would Hawley. Um, but the biggest concern for me is our attacking play. I don't think we create enough at all. Um, obviously, didn't have a shot on target. Edmore was the only one of the strikers who played to have a shot from open play. Um, and then I think Garner had one from a corner and then that was it. But it's, yeah, it's very worrying how much we rely on Moxon for creativity. Um, that would be my my focus ahead of a number nine. I think a number nine's important, but I think the players that we've got, Butterworth, Gibson, very similar. And you've got Maguire as well for that mould. And, we could we we really need something else. Um, yeah, I, I think a lot of teams have like sort of patterns of play when they're attacking, and I, you could see that with Oxford. Whenever a player got the ball, he knew where he could pass it to, what space he could run into. Whereas when we do it, it seems to be a bit off the cuff, which can be good, but at the same time as well, when there was times yesterday, Finback's getting the ball and he, he just had no options. There was nothing there for him, so. Yeah, I think the biggest issue, like it was at points last year, he's going to be scoring goals. So hopefully we can fix that soon. Pretty fair assessment. Pretty much agrees with what we said, doesn't yeah. it, really? Mm. Um, interesting that he doesn't think a number nine's the issue. He thinks he wants someone who's a bit more creative in there. Yeah, because I think, I've, cause I think to, we've got Edmondson and Garner to sort of play mm. as one striker. And you need someone else to play alongside one of them. Uh, yeah. Someone with a bit of pace and a bit of trickery. Um, yeah. who, who can make things happen and I, th I think one of the things that Harrogate we didn't have enough players trying to make things happen 
Yeah. We just had them sort of playing easy passes sideways or backwards. Because, I mean, Gibson's a player who makes things happen, but he does it in different areas of the pitch, doesn't he? I think that's mm. the key thing from that. As much as he can be a creative player, I don't think in that position it suits him at all, does it really? I think you've got to, if you're going to do that, you've got to have him playing a bit deeper, don't you? Yeah, I think when he's sort of playing as a deep forward, he's receiving the ball with his back to goal a little bit, and you want him mm. to receive the ball facing goal and facing forwards where he can really cause a lot of problems. I mean, I, I've said all along, you know, his role is a Mazala, which is very fancy, but it's basically mm. the one on the right-hand side of a three-man midfield, and he's sort of a bit of a winger, but he's also a bit of an attacking midfielder. He kind of operates in that corner of the pitch, sometimes skinning the full back, sometimes taking on the centre-back. I think we'd see the best of him in that role. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, right, Chris Martin, he sent us in one. I think he did one on Tuesday night as well, didn't he? So here's Chris Martin's assessment from the Oxford game. Oxford, much better than Tuesday. And my last review was quite negative, so I'm going to pick the positives from a 1-0 loss. Our full-backs were seriously good all game, and I think Mellish had a really good first half. Edmondson didn't really hold his position, but he was better than the other day. The left-hand side of Mellish, Armour and Charters linking up constantly on, in the first half was really good to see. Um, but we did let them through loads. It could have been 3 or 4 nil if their final ball and their finishing was better. Um, they got loads of shots off, but they were well wide. Um, same for their goal, really. Holy's positioning could have been a bit better. But the point of their goal was that Dan Butterworth was never offside, and that's how their attack started, from an offside free kick, which was never offside. Their goal kicks really annoyed me. I don't know why. Um, and towards the end of the game, we were playing like we were 3-0 down, when really we were only 1-0 down, and I'd love us to have just gone for the draw that little bit more. I'd like to know what our shots were for that game, because I can't actually remember any on target. I wouldn't be surprised if it's zero, but I'll check after I've recorded this. Um, on to Wigan. That Kassam car park was a nightmare to get out of. We didn't park in the car park. We parked uh, around the corner by one of the home pubs, really. It was quite a hand, actually, because we got away pretty easily afterwards. Horrendous traffic at Birmingham on the way back. We had to drive around Walsall, which is as much fun as you can expect. <laughs> uh, some interesting points in there. So, um, absolutely bang on about the Butterworth offside, by the way. I, sh- I should have pointed that out earlier on the goal one. He-, he was not offside. No way he was offside. I mean, I've watched back the clip. If you watch it, he would have to have been like lightning fast to have got from an offside position into an onside position there. He had to mm. be onside. If you watch the clip, I don't know if the goal clip, because I haven't seen the highlights, shows that free kick. Yeah, it doesn't go back that far. Right, well, it, it, 100%, I'm pretty sure he wasn't offside there. Definitely not. Uh, interesting that he felt Charters was quite good. I wasn't quite as convinced, to be honest. Um, Finn back, both fullbacks, they played pretty well. What I'd say, second half, it looked to me like Finn back was playing a little bit within himself. There's a mm. couple of times chasing the ball back, he wasn't going full pelt, and it made me think, ooh, is he just nursing this and making sure he doesn't do anything silly here and, mm. and push himself too far? Which does make me wonder if he'll play on Tuesday night against Wigan. That 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 adds a bit I of I don't think he will. No. Um, I tried to think there was something else he said in there. There was a couple of points that he, he raised. Um yeah, I, I just it just kind of felt like we just the final ball's not quite there. And he's right about it in terms of feeling like it was three 0 We didn't really go gung ho for it, and there was just a few times mm. where the the final ball just needs to be better. Sometimes they're trying to take extra touches, and I'm like, just get out of your feet and whip it in, or put the ball mm. into the box. And that's probably one of the reason why the play, players don't gamble because they think, oh, the ball's not coming in, and that needs to change. I think I think it needs to be a little bit more because at times we were quite gung ho last season in games. You know, we we just get mm. the ball forward and have a go, and but that seems to have just gone out of our game a little bit, doesn't it? Mm, yeah, definitely. Um, I noticed that at Harrogate, we were kind of passing it round a bit rather than, mm. you know, in injury time rather than just, you know, which I, I think it does come from the manager. Um, he's mm. he said before that, you know, your plan A is to sort of play the ball around and find an opening. Why why change that? If if plan B was so brilliant, it would be plan A. Um, yeah, which I, I, I kind of get, but at the same time, if plan A isn't working... You need plan B. Yeah, yeah, we did. We did. We did need something else in this game. I kind of feel. Um, yeah, a couple of other points from some of the stuff I'd written down there. Um, the wind in that stadium is horrendous because it's a three-sided yeah. stadium. There was one point in the uh, would have been the second in the first half. One of their players whipped in a cross from the right, and Holy came to come and get it, 
and the wind just complete and he was in the right position and the wind just suddenly pulled it back mm. and the attacker couldn't quite get to it because the attacker had gone to the same position as Holy to try and get the header <laughs> and he ended up heading it backwards instead it's just, it's just awful I mean I can totally get why they want to move ground because it's just it's not ideal it's nice-ish ground actually in the concourse it's alright but yeah that's that's the way that is um, other bits there was something else I wanted to say there um Da, da, da. Uh, the subs didn't really have a massive impact, to be honest. Butterworth was okay. Garner and Plans just couldn't get into the game. I'd say Jaden Harris had one decent run at the end. He, he brought a bit of power into it there at the end. He put a ball into the box that was cleared. I, I'd kind of like to see him giving a little bit run out, a bit of a longer run out of these games. I think we need a little say, bit more energy in these midfield. Yeah, it's not like the other midfielders are all really stamping their claim to be starting every week. No. No, absolutely. And, and he offers something a bit different. He's got that bit of power about him, hasn't he? And mm. sometimes you just need that. Someone who's going to go in and do that. I know we like to put Mellish into midfield every now and then, but I don't think it quite works in the same way, really, as that. Um, the other final point I'd make is, well, two games in, we played against a team that was comfortably mid-table last season and probably will be round about there this season. And then against a team that many people have tipped for the playoffs. I wasn't overly impressed with them, but people have tipped them. We haven't been outplayed by either team mm. in either of those games. We've been comfortably involved and we've been com- pretty comfortable defensively in both those games. I We just need to sort the attacking side out and I think we'll be okay. That That's yeah. the worry though, is if that drags on, then that starts to seep into the, oh, we can't get goals here. We're relying heavily on being good defensively here and that could mm. catch us out, couldn't it? So Yeah, definitely. That's the slight concern, but there you go. Um, right, just a quick rundown of the League One results before we finish the preview section, uh, review section, sorry, mate. Um, pretty straightforward. Bristol Rovers 1-1 with Barnsley at home. Derby fight got their first win of the season in their mm-hmm. local derby at Burton. It must be quite galling for them to go from local derbies against Forest and Leicester to play in Burton Albion, mm-hmm. wasn't it? But um, 3-0 win for them in that one. Uh, Bolton. Perfect start for the season, isn't it? I think was it yeah, two three wins in a row. Well. I think Dan's prediction's looking pretty smart right now, isn't it? I think it's mm. fair to say. Only two games in a bit hard to judge. Nil nil at Exton, Blackpool, Cambridge. We're all looking a bit stupid right now, aren't I we? I know. Yeah. Two games. We, in. I think we all said they were going to go down. Two games in, two two nil wins. Mm. <laughs> it's quite remarkable, isn't it? I, I I I have a feeling that will catch up on them at some points, but mm. I think they'll be pretty pleased with the way this started. Mm. Um. Leighton Orient, though, oof, not a good start at home, is it? No. 4 0 defeat. I've heard some suggestions that Sol Brin didn't have a great game for them as well. The, whoever was in nets, and there's a kind of a feeling like oh, we could really do Vigory right now, and he's not even mm. getting the Burnley squad on a match day, so that'll be frustrating for them. Lincoln City, 3 0 win over um, Wickham Wanderers. Not a great start mm-hmm. to the season, is it, Mike, for Wickham? No, I mean, who would have seen that one coming? Certainly not you. <laughs> Top two, was it? Top yeah. two, did you have them? Yeah. I think I think you're going to come to regret that prediction. Yeah, somehow. maybe. But, uh, but yeah, obviously United lost 1-0 at Oxford. Uh, Peterborough United, they got a 1-0 win over Charlton in two teams that I think most expect to be round about the playoffs this season. Yeah. Port Vale got a 1-0 win over Reading. Andy Carroll missed a penalty in this. Uh, your mate, um, who's the Reading fan in the WhatsApp chat that I'm in, Mike, um, was uh, asking if anyone would like a former England striker uh, on loan. Happily drive him to your club if you need him. So, I mean, we could do with someone like that, maybe. Andy Carroll, a big unit up there. Maybe. Mm-hmm. Maybe. I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon, though. Uh, Stevenage, great start to the season for them again. 2 0 mm. win at Shrews- against Shrewsbury. Really, really impressive for them. And obviously, Tuesday night opponents, Wigan Athletic. They uh, got a great start to the season as well. 2 uh, 1 against Northampton. Came in from behind in this one as well. So, a really good result for them. Um, we're not looking at the table or anything right now, are we? Because we're no. a few games in, so we'll just leave that for now. Uh, we'll take a short break and then we'll be back with the preview of the um, Wigan Athletic game. Hi, I'm Owen Moxon and you're listening to the Brunton Bugle. And we're back into the second half. Looking ahead to Tuesday night's game against Wigan Athletic at Brunton Park. I should say I completely forgot the start to do uh, Dan's question of the week. Because we said we we're going to do this at the start of episodes now. So what we'll do is we'll do it at the start of the second half of the show this week. Um, so Dan's question of the week he's put together for us. I'm guessing it's Wigan Athletic related. Very interested to see what he picks for this one. So uh, here's Dan's question of the week. Now, back when we used to play Wigan regularly in the uh, 90s, uh, they went all exotic when they signed the free Spaniards. 
obviously Roberto Martinez is the most well known. Uh, Jesus Saber was the second, and the third was Isidro Izzy Diaz. And this question features Diaz. Diaz scored a winning goal against Carlisle, but it wasn't for Wigan. Who was it for? No oh, come idea. On, Dan, that's a ridiculous <laughs> question. I think, I think it might be Walsall. I'm just guessing off the top of my head. I have a feeling he played for Walsall as well as Carlisle. That's a straight. It just rings a bell for some reason with me. I might be wrong. I have no Walsall idea. It's or, a little bit before my time. Walsall or Chester? No, but I think Martin has played for Chester. I think that's why I've got that in my head. Um, yeah, I'm going to go Walsall anyway. We'll, we'll we'll see later in the show. We'll get the answer for you guys then. Um, right, Behind Enemy Lines is back. We didn't have it for the Oxford game because for some reason there's no Oxford blogs or podcasts they wanted to talk to us, which is a bit strange, but there you go. Um, for this one, I spoke to Barry from the Progress with Unity podcast. Progress with Unity is the town motto of Wigan, which I do say in this recording in a minute, so I don't know why I've just told you that again there, but there you go. Um, but yeah, I had a really, really good chat with Barry. Really, really good guy. Um, what did we talk about? We talked about uh, the off-the-field issues in recent seasons and there. Good start to the current campaign, actually, I think it's fair to say. Uh, a bit about Charlie White's return from his heart issues and a bit of the, on the rivalry between the two clubs in the 1990s. So here's the chat I had with Barry ahead of this midweek game. Yes, after a week off last week, because we couldn't find an Oxford fan to, to speak to ahead of the, uh, the the game this at the weekend, we're back with Behind Enemy Lines, where we speak to an opposition fan about their team that we're facing uh, in the upcoming game uh, to get a bit of background on them. And it's, it's a club where we've had a, a bit of a rivalry back in the 90s, but I think it's fair to say they've been on a di- different stratosphere to us <laughs> over the last 20 or so years. But rivalries will be resumed uh, on Tuesday night because it's Wigan Athletic and we're speaking to Barry Worthington from the, uh, oh, you know, I've just written this down and I've literally just closed down the thing to say what it is. The Progress with Unity podcast, which I understand is named after the town motto of Wigan. Barry, uh, good to speak to you. Um, let's talk Wigan then. Considering all the turmoil surrounding the club over the last, you know, probably five or six years, a bit longer, um, and starting the season on minus eight points because of issues to do with the previous owner, you must be pretty chuffed with your start of the season so far. You know, two games, six points. Absolutely, delightedly, yeah. To be honest, um, we finished last season in, in disarray. Um, we had the uh, the Phoenix Twenty One group who, who was who was home the club, the Bahraini group, and they haven't put any money in since February, and they're refus- refusing to to pay wages. Um, and it looked like, to be honest with you, around the six. 6th of June, it looked like the club was about to fold. Um, luckily, we've had uh, a local businessman. Well, he's, he's, he's born in Wigan, but he's, he's, uh, he lives in the US now. Uh, mm-hmm. He's a billionaire, Mike Danson, and he owned Wigan Warriors. So oh. he's, he was approached by the council, our local MP, and the head of our um, supporters club, if he could come and help us out and save the club. And... He, he's decided to do that. Um, Sean Maloney, uh, Sean Mal- I said that again. Sean Maloney, <laughs> who is our manager, um, has been instrumental as well in talking Mike Danson to come to the club. Um, he's, he said that he can run uh, the, the football side of things in a sustainable manner. He has a plan. He's put that forward. Uh, it's based around younger players um, promoting grad- graduates from the academy. Uh, and he, Mike Danson's bought into it. He has. He's a big community guy. He loves supporting underprivileged communities, and he sees this as one of those projects. So we're very, very grateful. So we got to the start of the season. We lost 17 pro senior pros from the end of last season. We've uh, brought in a, a, a lot of free transfers and, and loan players, and like I said, we've uh, promoted eight graduates from the academy into the first-team squad. Uh, Malone has worked his magic, and we couldn't have wished for a better start. The the football's fantastic. We've got six points. We was even on TV last week when we played Wrexham away. I mean, that was a bit of a... Yeah, we made a lot of changes for, for, for that game, so that wasn't one to gauge anything off. But uh, absolutely delighted with our start to the season. And it's gone from minus eight in Wigan to uh, minus two, so it's getting warmer. 
Well, you're only three points behind us now. So <laughs> if you win, you I think you'd probably go ahead of us, wouldn't you, in the table uh, on, on Tuesday night? Um, well, you've sort of covered a little bit there, but my second question was, I know this is quite difficult, but can you briefly explain to our listeners what the issues with the ownership have been sort of down the years? I think we were talking before we started recording here that obviously it goes back to 95 Dave Whelan takes over and I think everybody knows what a brilliant job he did in terms of putting money into the club and getting you to the Premier League and winning the FA Cup you know what a moment that in your history was then when he when he left what probably from that point the point I think is where fans maybe would need a bit of background so what happened from then well he, he sold to a um Chinese, well, a Hong Kong consortium mm-hmm. and um they was headed by a guy called Stanley Cho uh, who was supposedly a billionaire. But, I mean, they started off by uh, investing a lot of money in, into the club. We got mm-hmm. one of those uh, brand-new pitches, you know, the uh, ah, half, uh, artificial half-grass. Uh, Synthetic ones, yeah, I think they're called. Yeah, one of those. Uh, we had a big screen erected. Um, we bought a, a new training ground. Uh, everything was brilliant. And we, we started signing players who was... Usually out of our reach, you know, we've been like we brought in Keith and Muo, um, lot, lots of players we brought in, like in the million pound plus uh, bracket, and things were going really, really well. And then there was um, rumours of something that had happened. I know I, I, nobody's ever got to the bottom of this, but we changed hands. Uh, we went from this um, this ownership group headed by Stanley Choi to something called the New Leader Fund. And there's big rumours about the fact that it was uh, all surrounding a bet that we were going to get relegated and uh, our form had suddenly picked up and uh, they wanted to put us into administration so we'd get minus 12 points and it said relegators and there was a lot of, lot of, lot of bad stuff going on behind the scenes. But basically, at that point, it was um, during COVID, there there was no people going to the games, there was no revenue coming into the club. And they they pulled the plug on us and stuck us into administration. And it was a big worry then because who's going to buy a football club when there's no cash coming in? Uh, And we found for nine months we was in deep financial poo-poo. We had to sell the entire squad. We brought in um, some, some like, really... Journeymen, uh, Joe, one of your players at the moment, Joe Garner, was with us <laughs> at the time. He left us and went to play in India. We brought in quite a, a few journeymen, who uh, Corey Whelan being one of those, another one of your players, mm-hmm. promoted um, young lads through, through the academy. But they weren't ready, and we really struggled. We was in League One. Liam Richardson, who was the manager, did a fantastic job, kept us up on the, the last day of the season. And uh, we were taken over by... Um, the Bahraini group, who, who were Phoenix 21, they came in in March. Uh, so for the first 12 months, they looked like they were everything they said they were, they were going to be. And then they stopped the money coming in as well. So we were back to square one. <laughs> and it, it was very frightening because this time round, it looked as though we was going to be... Uh, in a, well, we were in a in a more precarious position than what we have been before during administration because there was no administration coming. We, we were facing a winding up order from HMRC. We owed players wages, we owed staff wages, we owed local businesses loads of money. Uh, like I said, this we got this American Wigan American guy came in. The first week that he was in the club, he he spent seven million quid clearing the debts. Wow. Um, Sean Maloney had this plan together where he said he could run the, the club uh, on a three million quid a season, including including everything, wages, transfer fees, everything. Uh, Danson's agreed to that. Um, I don't know what our income it, revenue is, but it's it's probably not too far off that. So I, I, I should assume we're running at a slight loss, which uh, our new owner is willing to stand. Um and, and that's where we are now. So the future's a lot brighter. Um, it, we're looking at having a more sustainable club. Uh, our, our average gates are around 10,000. Uh, and I'd sooner as have a football club that will be able to run on that on that rather than go and spend yeah. and bring 
you know, big plays in splashing out transfer fees, paying big wages. It, it doesn't work. I'd sooner have a football yeah. club that I can look forward to going to watch every single week than, you know, chasing wild dreams. So um, I, I'm quietly confident that we've got over the bad news and we are actually moving forward at this moment in time. You've pretty much covered my second question. I was going to ask you a question there after that about uh, cutting your cloth more accordingly in the future because obviously the fact that you spent a lot in previous seasons and well, you pretty much answered that. You said you're quite happy with that, so that we'll, we'll move on. Um, there used to be quite a big rivalry between the two clubs, didn't they? In the 90s, I think we, we played a lot uh, against each other. Um, then obviously Dave Whedon came in and you, you went to a different level altogether. Um, any memories of back in those days? I think we were talking beforehand that the, the two clubs have never drawn a game, which is remarkable, really, when you think about it, isn't it? Um, yeah, I imagine Wigan fans are quite looking forward to their trip to Brunton Park as well on Tuesday. Yeah, yeah, they are. Uh, I mean, you, you had a Wigan lad play for you back in the 90s, Warren Aspinall. He oh, grew up. Warren, what a guy. <laughs> yeah, what a guy. I mean, he, he, he's... He broke into our team as a 17-year-old, scored a, oh. the penalty that took us to Wembley in the Freight Rover Trophy. Uh, and uh, we sold him to Everton. And then he went on to play for Villa, Pompey, in, you know, in the top flight and ended up playing with you. And, yeah, what, what a great, great guy. And his, his brother as well, Wayne Aspinall, played for us. Yeah, uh, Fantastic rivalry. And if we take it back even further, um, we hold the record um, in the FA Cup for a non-league side beating a league side with uh, Brunton Park. You'll not remember this because I don't remember it. We were 1934 and we beat you 6-1. <laughs> Do you know what? So I, we, we've done an episode we, on our, a special feature episode on our thing years back. Um, I, feel, I have a feeling possibly a couple of players who played in that game only, only played one game ever for us. I think one of them was a goalkeeper as well, possibly. Or I might have mixed that up with a game against Wigan Borough, actually, because Wigan Borough win the league, weren't they, around about those times as well? So... There's definitely a memory of like uh, we've we've talked about this on one of our past episodes, a feature episode, I think maybe I might be wrong with that. To be fair, yeah. Well, um, Wigan, but Wigan Athletic uh, grew out of Wigan Borough. Wigan ah, Borough, right. yeah, went in '32, and Wigan Athletic were born in '32, so and played at the same ground. So it was just a previous incarnation. That's all. But yeah, so we all that record six-one uh, win. Um, but in the nineties, yeah, there was always this massive rivalry, and I, I remember, uh, I remember going up. To, I mean, what, one of the guys on our podcast that want me to talk about the time that Izzy drew, he, um, Diaz came up and, and destroyed you. But the game I remember most was me and my missus went up, and uh, I was in the fire service at the time, and I didn't know where to park the car, so I, I phoned the Carlisle fire station up and said, "Is there anywhere I can park?" And this guy said, "Park on my drive." So we parked on his drive, which was about two miles from the ground. I didn't realise this at the time. So we, so we walked to the ground. It was a nice day. I got my Wigan Athletic top on, and we stayed. Uh, it was behind the goals, and and, and you beat us. And uh, at the end of the game, this, this Bobby says, "Right, you, you're not going out. We're going to kick you in, and we'll go bring your coaches round. And you can just get on your coach. It'll be a lot lot safer for you." Um, you know, for making your way home. I said, I'm not in the coach, I'm in my car. So he said, uh, where are you parked? So I told him, he said, oh my goodness. He said, you're in for a rough ride. So <laughs> me and the missus, like, he was, uh, we, we, he said, have you not got a coat to put on? I said, I'm, he said, well, I don't know what to suggest, but we got all, we were safe and sound at the end. I think the fact that you've beaten us that day probably helps us to get home safely. But uh, yeah, that that's my abiding memory of going to Carlisle. A defeat and uh, worrying about going home safely. <laughs> I think I was thinking since you guys built the DW Stadium on JJB as it was back then initially, um, I, we obviously haven't played at the DW Stadium. And I think actually the only couple of games we've played against you since like ninety seven, ninety eight, I think we're both in the auto windscreen shield, weren't they? I think. I have a feeling we beat you two one in one game, and I think another game you beat three nil. I remember going to both of those actually. I think. Um, but yes, it, it has been a long... Since those league games, we've only played it twice, and that was in the, the AWS, which is incredible when you think yes, about it, isn't it? Yeah, that's, that's correct. I mean, like you said, we've been on a different trajectory. We we had the uh, benefit of Dave Whelan's cash, and, and we rose through the through the leagues, and we spent eight seasons in the top flight, where you have you had those troubles, you struggled. I mean, the, the, the thing I remember, Jimmy Glass's goal, you know, mm. on the last day of the header, I mean, I think that's, that's in football football, that, isn't it? Yeah. But... That was like a stay of execution for you, weren't it? And eventually you did drop out of the league. 
And, best and best it, thing that happened for us though, going out because it gave us a fresh start as much as anything really. So just show, goes to show sometimes. <laughs> yeah, well, those resets are, are, are good, and we was hoping with that with the administration, but we've had another reset <laughs> since then. So, <laughs> yeah. so hopefully, hopefully that that comes uh, you know that comes true. So, yeah, it's, it's it's like reacquainting with old friends in a way, isn't it? You know, so I think uh, there's quite a few Latics fans looking forward to coming up on Tuesday. And like we, you were saying earlier on about uh, the fact that it is on a Tuesday and on a Saturday, it's, it's put a little bit of a damper on things. But, yeah, it's always nice having the trips. Uh, it's still a local trip, I suppose, for, for you anyway, isn't it? You know, because oh, for, for us, definitely, yeah. Off, you know, uh, we're just doing the M6 for you. It's the West Coast mainline as well, isn't it? It's the fact that you basically every train going south from Carlisle pretty much is stopping at Wigan. So mm-hmm. it's an easy one to get to. I mean, I, I was saying to you before, I travel from Liverpool for every home game. And I remember, it, what was it, the end of last season, maybe? But it would have been the end of last season. Yeah, I I get the northern train to, to Wigan Northwest and get off there and then get on the um, the West Coast mainline. And I was getting, the, I got on the train from Highton that is the fast one, but it goes all the way to Blackpool North. And as it comes up to this stage, the platform, I look, and it's just a horde of people. And it's stank of booze. And I was like, what's going on? It opened the doors. Like, oh, yeah, we're going to run away at Blackpill today, aren't they? <laughs> so it's just the, <laughs> the masses traveling up to Blackpill for a day out. I think you guys were pretty much done by then anyway, weren't you? So they were just doing for a good good day out on the seaside. So fantastic stuff. Um, Sean Maloney, then, you sort of briefly touched him already. Um Quite a popular player, I think it was, wasn't he, when he uh, played for you guys? Um, how How's he doing as manager? What's your thoughts on him? Because obviously he's coming in difficult circumstances, but I mean, so far this season especially, he seems to be doing a decent job. Yeah, fabulous uh, legend. He he took the corner that we scored off Manchester oh, yeah, City of in the FA Cup final. Um, he was player of the season. He, he was a magical player, absolutely top-class player. Um, but then coaching is another game. He's been he's worked with Roberto Martinez, who a lot of Wigan people is the finest coach ever to coach a football team. He's, he's my all time mm. favourite Wigan athletic manager. So we worked with him over at uh, Bedham. He's also studied at the Johan Cruyff School of Coaches in oh. Holland. And again, Cruyff is another legendary coach. His ideas on football streets ahead at the time. So he's come in and he's reshaped he's reshaped us again. Well, we were always a football inside. Then we went under Liam Richardson. We went to this like gritty battling team who played like when I said percentage based football rather than possession based. So we yeah. was we scored off the goals from free kicks and, and mm-hmm. corners, you know, that type of football, a bit direct. No, we've just like we're knocking it around and uh, they were like prime Barcelona, but I tell you what, it's a joy to watch. It's mm. so refreshing. Um, we take risks. You know, he's got the back two play, and you mentioned about uh, your black, you've got a back two. We, we've been playing with just two defenders at, at some times, and uh, it's, it, but it's good to watch he, the way he sets us up. He's not afraid to change the formation during games, uh, which he does two or three times. Martinez used to do that quite regular. Uh, 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 and it's it's a joy touch, like I said, and the, the, you can see the young lads coming in. They're all comfortable on on the ball. They're all good football players, mm-hmm. uh, who are under pressure, um, and, and they're always looking to drive the ball forward as well, which is good to see. You know, we're not just like knocking it aimless across the back line. We're looking to penetrate. Um, we've got. A bit of pace back in the team, Callum McManaman, who scored yesterday in our 2-1 win over the Northampton. But he's, he's carrying a bit of a knock, so I don't think he'll be starting on Tuesday night. He might come on as an impact. So, But we've, we've got a bit of pace in the team as well. Um, and up top, we've got Charlie Wyke, who's a, you know, an out-and-out goal scorer. That's really a big centre-forward uh, and likes scoring. But uh, our main uh, prize asset, I mean, you were... T- spoke to me about uh, some of your younger players who's been there for a while. We've got this lad at the back called Charlie Hughes. He's, he's 19. Um, we we believe he's going to be playing Premier League. He's that good. Mm. He's an absolute Rolls-Royce of a defender. Uh, you'll see him on, on Tuesday. Um, you'll see just see how good he is. He can use both feet. Good in the tackle. Brilliant in the air. Excellent on the ball. Can pass short passes, long passes. Superb. And We've just promoted um, 21-year-old Sam Tittle 
goalkeeper. He's more like a, a sweeper than a goalkeeper. <laughs> you know, he's uh, integral with, with our two centre-backs. Uh, our other centre-back who we got from Bayern Munich, uh, he's only 20 years of age, Liam Morrison. He's in on loan from Bayern Munich. Uh, and in front of them, we've got uh, we signed on a three-year deal from Arsenal on a free transfer, Matt Smith. I know we've picked him up on a free transfer behind me, uh, beyond me. He's absolutely superb. So, um, yeah, we're playing like that type of football. We'll, we, you know, we'll, we'll knock, we'll knock it to, to the centre mid. We'll knock it back to centre half. Give it a centre mid turn, and we're away. Um, it's good to watch. It really is, and I, I'm absolutely buzzing for this season. It should be a good contest some Tuesday night, then, because we don't tend to have that much of the ball. We like to press basically and win it back and get hit on the break. So. Two contrasting styles, and it should, sounds like it should be all right. You mentioned Charlie White there. Now, Charlie White's an ex-Carlisle player. He, yes. um, so, basically, we were the club where he basically broke onto the scene and did really well. We signed him from Middlesbrough for, like, a nominal fee, and I think he did a release cost of a quarter of a million, hence why we ended up losing him in the end, unfortunately. But he, yeah, brilliant goal scorer for us. I think he scored one in three, I think, having had a slow start. And uh, his story is fantastic, though, isn't it? I think we, we all still follow him in our pod. You know, we have an X Files section at the end where we just we mention all the players who've scored. He used to play for us at the weekend and stuff. And his name pops up fairly often, whatever club he's at. And after what happened with him, with his, you know, heart scaring, you know, issues, you know, in recent seasons, for having back playing and scoring goals must be brilliant. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's got a defib fitted uh, yeah. on his red cage. So, uh, you know, I, 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 the psychological aspect of that for him, mm. you know, to be out on the pitch. I mean, he took a knock yesterday and he was down for a, a minute or two and everybody held their breath, you know, because that's mm. how you are with him. But I think last season uh, was the first season that he came back and he, he didn't feature much. And I think he, he did an interview and he, he, he said he was struggling with it. You know, he was trying to protect his defib. But it's this season, he's a totally different player. He's, he's like the player yeah. that we first signed, where he's rough and ready to go. He's, he's getting stuck in. Um, and he's, he scored two goals away at Derby County on the opening day of the season. One was an header, one wasn't. We took it around the keeper, so different types of goals. But he's, he's involved in the build-up play as well. He's, he's yeah. looking good. And it's, it, it is a brilliant story. And uh, we, we actually see the opposition supporters clapping him as well you know so it is something yeah. that I think everybody's bought, bought into so it's it's good to see uh, and I'm sure he'll, he'll love going back to Carlisle I, I, I knew he'd played for you and, and brought through there so I'm sure he'd love to go back up there because he's I know you have a, a, a co- connection with the North East don't you and he's a North Eastern lad and yeah. um, even though you're in the North West but yeah so I think his family will be over as well for, to watch that one so that he'll be looking forward to that he'll 100% get a good reception yeah he he didn't live on bad terms or anything like that. At the end of the day, his release clause was paid, and Bradford got him. That's <laughs> just the, the reality of the situation we were in at the time. And and yeah, he you know he's a great goal scorer for us. And I don't think it might be the first time he's played against us since he left. Actually, I'm trying to think of the because I don't think we played Bradford in any cups or anything. And he left before they got relegated. So so yeah. Um, right. Well, you, you've actually covered one of the questions I had about um, in terms of people to watch in your team in your, in your transfer activity. You've covered that really thoroughly in the other answers. So I'll quickly ask you about the two. Um, ex Latics who are in uh, the Carlisle squad. Obviously, uh, we've sort of briefly touched on them at, there, but Joe Garner and Corey Whelan, um, not players who made a massive impact with you guys, I think it's fair to say. No, it, it, it did. It, well, he came in as, as, and we needed uh, a little bit of experience coming in, but he's still a young lad and he had played a lot of football when he came to mm. us. But he, he never, he let us down. You know, you can't say he let us down. And, no. But I wasn't surprised when we didn't say, when we got out of administration, I wasn't surprised that he, you know we didn't try and sign him on a permanent because yeah. uh, he didn't feature too much. And, and the other one that you've sort of alluded to, Joe Garner. Mm. <laughs> well, he, I mean, Joe came with a bit of a reputation, and he yeah. was exactly he exactly lived up to that. He was uh, yeah. Every time he went on the pitch, he looked like he wanted to have a fight with somebody. So, yeah. uh, and it's that's been the case when we've played against him since he's left us. When we played Fleetwood, he got sent off. For uh, having a, a, a like a wrestling match with uh, James McLean, <laughs> so yeah, I remember that. that. Yeah, I remember that one. Yeah, yeah it was, that was a mad one, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. He, he's an interesting one, Joey. He, he's hugely popular with our fans, but I think some mm. fans get frustrated with him with those sort of things. You know, doing that all the time. And I do wonder. It's one of those ones. I think any other team we're playing on Tuesday, he might have got a start. We might have looked to put him in, bearing in mind that 
issue in terms of what he, what he can be like against his former clubs. I, I do wonder if he might be left on the bench for this one, possibly being brought on late on instead. Um, Barry, you've been really, really generous with your time. Thank you so much. Um, before we finish, I've got to ask you for your prediction for Tuesday night. Well, we've never had a draw. Um, and uh, My prediction, we've never had a draw. So do I go for a draw in this one to break the mould? I tell you what, we've won 2 1 in both our games so far. I'm going for a 2 1 Latix win. So fingers crossed that you have a good season, uh, but it doesn't start against us. So I'm going for a Wigan Athletic 2 1 win. Well, Barry, I'm going to I'm going to echo that. I'm going to say I wish you all the best for the rest of the season, except Tuesday night. So uh, <laughs> thanks for your time and yeah, all the best. Cheers, Lee. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, once again, huge thanks to Barry. We're always really grateful for the uh, time that uh, the opposition pods give up to talk to us uh, ahead of these games. It's, it's really, really, really welcomed. Um, yeah, Wigan Athletic, Mike. Um, I think most people were expecting to get away from trouble at the start of the season, weren't they? I mean, obviously, minus eight points are starting on because of the financial issues under the previous owner. But, I mean, they couldn't have had a better start to the season, could they? The win over Derby and then the uh, win against Northampton. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I hope it, I hope not, but if they get a decent result on Tuesday, they're back on positive points, aren't they? It should be point if they get a win on Tuesday, they will go ahead of us in the table. Yes. Well. So that that's something we have to consider there. They will jump up quite a, a few places and we could be looking thinking, oh dear, we're, we're right down here now. But anyway, I mean, no one looks at the table at this stage and they shouldn't do it. No. It's ridiculous. I always say six games in is when you can start looking at the table. Mm. Even then, you're probably a little bit early, but but there you go. Um, yeah, interesting ones because obviously they've had all these financial issues in, in recent seasons. They had the two years under the I think the Bahrain Bahrainian guy who mm. them, who then just decided he wasn't going to put any more money in in February or something, which is ridiculous. That's not the way you run a football club, is it? But well, well, it is the way a lot of people run football clubs. That's the problem. <laughs> um, but this guy is coming. I think is it was it Dave Benson or something like that. I think he said on there. I can't remember. I should really know this, but. Um, He's the guy who owns Wigan Warriors as well, the rugby league team, and he basically just saved the club in because he doesn't want it to go bust and he, he wants to to keep it going. And running sensibly is probably the best thing for Wigan. They've had the glory years, haven't they? And I think that they can probably mm. establish themselves as a solid League One club that bounced up to the championship every now and then. Yeah, um, I mean, it's quite interesting where their gates are at. They're very up and down, mm. uh, really, because I think... They weren't getting well. When I think when he first went up to the Premier League, they were getting okay gates. I think they're getting like over fifteen thousand. But I mean, it's more of a rugby town, isn't it? Really? Yeah, but I think the rugby fan, uh, the football fans, would point out that actually they generally get better gates than the rugby team at times. Sometimes, mm. yeah, the, even the rugby team struggled to get um, big crowds on, for some games. I'm just trying to find out what the gate was for yesterday's game. I think let's have a look. Uh, had a crowd of ten thousand and ninety five, so decent mm. effort. Not not as big as we managed, you know. We we mm. managed a bit bigger for our opening game, but but they're they're, they're just re establishing themselves, aren't they? And I'm sure they'll you know started on minus points, but it doesn't help things either really for them. Mm. But um but yeah, um looking at their summer transfer activity, mate, we talked about this in the preview uh mm. season preview pod. Some pretty smart signings in there, isn't there? I think it's fair yeah. To there's some question marks over some others. Uh like we said, Callum McManaman was a weird one. Well, uh, they seemed really happy with him, and he scored in in the weekend game against Northampton. I don't think he's quite fit to be starting games yet, but no, I think but, he well, some about, pace. Yeah, apparently, like he's one of them pre-season. He came back in good shape, mm. uh, which you see when he hasn't been for a couple of years. Um, but yeah, he's getting on a bit now, isn't he? He's about thirty-three. 32, 33, something like that, yeah. yeah. But apparently he's still got a bit of pace there and he still causes problems. So he got his goal against um, Northampton at the weekend. I think Matt Smith sounds like a very good signer to them. He sounds like yeah. they're quite gobsmacked that they managed to get him for free on a mm. three-year deal as well because he, he mm. sounds like a player who's really, really impressed. And Liam Morrison from Bayern Munich seems to be good. Yeah. Sean Clare from Charlton Athletics, another one who's got good experience at this level. Um, yeah. For me, it's the players they've lost that sort of uh, yeah. maybe raises more concern for them because the basically lost the spine of the team really hmm. uh you know i mean james mclean went to wrexham recently uh jack watmore went to preston um i've always thought he's a good defender what? um curtis tilt as well as like experienced center back he's gone to salford yeah i think they, they had to let a lock in some of max power obviously went to el kadish mm. get this right el kadsia 
would you say? I'll I go with know. that. We'll go with that anyway. I should really learn these pronunciations <laughs> before to get episodes, you know. I mean, to be fair with the James McLean one, he's, what, 33 and they've got a quarter of a million pounds for him? Yeah. And Wrexham, that's just, that sums up Wrexham, really, isn't it? Just throwing money at it. But yeah. for them, they're thinking, great, that, that's probably covering a couple of players' wages for them for the season, really, you know. Mm. So, totally makes sense. I think he's one of those ones McLean is very much a sort of love-hate relationship where every club he goes to. I think Wrexham's a club where he's probably quite well liked. I think. Yeah. Well, I think Wigan fans, when they signed him, were a little bit dubious, but he won them over with his yeah. performances. Yeah. But yeah, I, I agree with you. They've lost a fair few players, but it, they're working with a tighter squad. They've promoted a lot of young players. And so far, Maloney seems to be the reason why they're doing so well, doesn't he? he, he he's mm. someone who's worked under Robert, Roberto, Martin, Ma, Roberto Martinez. My tongue this mm. week, I don't know what it is. Um <laughs> Yeah, and and seems to be implementing a, a really good style of football from what I can gather. They, as Barry was saying there, they play a very strong sort of possession based game, and they try and you know play it out and keep the ball. Whatever could work quite well for us though, because we tend to like playing against teams like that, and we just get get at them, don't we? Really, and, and yeah, we press. do. Mm. So it could really work quite well. Uh, as we mentioned, obviously the weekend they uh, we were two one winners over Northampton Town. Uh, Sam Hoskins had given Northampton the lead after twenty four minutes, and then goals on. 72 and 79 minutes from Hughes and McBannerman gave them the three points. Um, try to over top. I mean, they've already sold 1,100 tickets for this game on Tuesday night, mm. which is a good effort, I think it's fair to say. Mm. But Tuesday night, no trains on, obviously, you can't get back on the train. Um, their first visit in however many years. So I'm hoping it'll be a really good crowd and good atmosphere this one, don't you? Mm. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Uh, I mean,. We don't have much in the way of derbies <laughs> this season. No. Uh, this is maybe... The nearest thing you can get to it, really, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and, yeah, it'd be, it'd be nice if we could sort of set up a bit of a, you know, I, I don't want to say rivalry, but it's nice to have games where there's just a little bit more to them than, you know, when you're playing against Oxford or whoever, you know. Well, that's the question is maybe, is that a game then where you start Joe Garner possibly? Because, you know, Joe Garner, last time he played for Fleetwood against um, Wigan, got sent off having a scrap with James McLean, didn't he? So <laughs> there, that probably sums up, you know, his ex-Wigan ex player, I'm pretty sure he'll be quite happy to uh, to start a scrap in that one again, probably. Um, yeah, uh, Charlie Wake in there as well. Great story that, isn't it? Him coming back from his heart issues. And yeah, I think this will be, will this be his first visit back to Brunton Park, won't it, I think? Yeah, I don't think he's been back since, no. No, maybe played in a pre-season game or something against us, I don't know, but I don't think Bradford, he'd already left Bradford by the time they came down, hadn't he, I think? Yeah, so, yeah. So yeah, no, really nice to see Charlie. I'm sure he'd get a really good reception from the fans, won't he, for this game. Um, mm. Yeah, um, can they make the playoffs though? Is that minus eight going to be maybe a bit too much to stop them doing it? But I think they still could, yeah. Um, I mean, I don't, like I mean, you know, mathematically they could. I'm not sure that there's enough in their squad to do it when you compare them to other playoff candidates. I, I think the issue is going to come if they get a few injuries. I think that's where mm. they'll have problems. I think their start eleven is as good as most in this division. Actually, when you look at, it, I think mm. there's a bit of quality in there, and, and yeah. it can really cause problems. I mean, any team in this division would love a striker like White. You know, in terms mm. of goals, he'd, he'll score goals for fun. But I, I kind of feel like. Yeah, if they get two or three injuries, they might then start thinking the squad's looking a little bit thin here. And it's kind of like us last season. You can mm. carry on with that for a bit, but then you get to a point where it starts to catch up with you. So I think if they make the playoffs, they're scraping in in sixth place. I don't think they're, they're going to be like third, fourth, whatever. But I think, I think if they were to make it. the playoffs, I can't see them going up through them. I disagree. I think if they make the playoffs, they go up because because that minus eight, mm. they'll have scored a hell of a lot of points to get there. I, I, feel, mm. I feel like that potentially puts them in a better position, possibly. But I kind of get what you mean. I kind of maybe you think they're, they're not quite there in terms of the quality. Yeah. Next season might be the one for them if they can really develop the, the young players there. But there you go. Yeah. Um, right, play for both. So we've reinvigorated this feature this season, uh, and Dan is doing this for each week. So here is Dan's play for both. For Wigan Athletic. Oh, wait, that's the wrong one. I need to press the wrong button there. Play for both from Dan. Some good players I could have put in uh, there played for both, but I'm going to go with a man who achieved one of the things that you don't see much in football in that he played for two countries. 
in his career. Uh, he was born in Guadeloupe, and it's Pascal oh. Chimbonda. Mm. Uh, he started out at Le Havre uh, in the B team, onto the first team, uh, moved to Bastia. Then he got his break when he moved to Wigan, and I think it was 2005. A uh, good couple of years at Tottenham, a year at Sunderland, a couple of years at Blackburn, very short spell at Queen's Park Rangers. Uh, he actually played for Doncaster as well. And uh, he'd, he'd actually been at Market Drayton Town after Doncaster before he uh, he came and played for ourselves for the season. And uh, he was one of those players that you could just tell he'd played at the higher level. Uh, after ourselves, he went to Arles Avignon in uh, France uh, before playing for Washington and Ashton Town. Uh, I mentioned his international career there. Uh, he played qualifiers for the, I think it was a Caribbean Cup for Guadeloupe. But Guadeloupe aren't actually a FIFA registered country. So he was also able to make a, a one match for France uh, in a World Cup warm-up match 2006 against Denmark. Uh, he was in maybe played three or four minutes at the end. He was in the uh, World Cup squad, but he, uh, he didn't play a minute. And then back 2012, he played three more games for Guadeloupe in a Caribbean Cup again. I think I'll conquer Calf Gold Cup. I've maybe got them the wrong way around. But yeah, uh, not often we uh, feature an international in this section, Pascal Jim Bonder. I'm going to demand he picks a player who's been good for, for us at some point. Really. <laughs> I'm only joking. I thought Pascal Chimbond is a, a better player than he actually got credit for. for he us, was actually. in a bad side, wasn't he? He was in a bad side and you could see he was a good player and he was trying mm. his best to make us better. And It's interesting because he, he came to us and played centre-back pretty much, didn't he? I don't think he ever yeah. actually... I'm not sure he actually played right-back once for us. I don't think he did, no. I'm pretty sure he played centre-back most of the time. But yeah, he was... Um, yeah, you know, he, he was unlucky to play in such a rubbish car United side, let's be brutally mm. honest here. I think in a good side, he'd, he'd, just, he'd really stood out as a good player in there. But um, but yeah, Pascal Chimbonda, interesting choice. Especially when I read out the list of the other players, I'm thinking some of the players he left off here. Ben Amos, who's actually at Wigan now, he's one of the backup keepers, I think, isn't he? So um, mm. he's still involved there. Warren Aspinall. Come on, Dan, Warren Aspinall's an <laughs> obvious choice, isn't he? Surely. Pascal Chimbonda. Zach Clough, maybe not. Um, <laughs> Sam Cosgrove, Wayne Entwistle, Joe Garner, obviously he's currently at Carlisle, Reese James, Luke Joyce, Graham Kavanagh. You know, he's a legendary player for Wigan, isn't he? They'd love him there still. Mm. Um, David Lee, um, he only played a handful of games for us, I think, in 2000 and 2001 season, I think. Uh, Scott McGarvey, Colin Methven, Jordan Musto, who I think we mentioned him fairly recently on the... Uh, Ex-Blues, didn't we? I think he's playing out. Mm. Is he playing somewhere in Bulgaria, somewhere mad like that? Yes, yeah, more um, like that. Eric Nixon, uh, Jamie Proctor, James Tavernier, Magno Vieira, Corey Whelan, Winston White, and Charlie White. Not as many as I thought. I thought there'd be mm. a lot more than that, you know, being Northwest based now. But yeah, there's probably some I've missed off there. I do apologize if I have. Eric Nixon's an interesting one because I'm pretty sure he holds the record of having played in all four divisions in one season. Mm. Back in the day, I think it was in the 80s, he played for us. But I think in that season, he also played for like Man City, maybe in the top flight, and a couple of other clubs. And because of loan spells he had, he was playing mm. for four different clubs in, in four different divisions, which is quite impressive effort. Could, couldn't do that now. Well, you, actually, you could technically, couldn't you, I suppose? With the old seven If you're a goalkeeper. Mm. Yeah, with the old seven day loan rule, I guess. Yeah, I guess you could. Um, yeah, anything else to talk about? Yeah, so I want the referee for this game. The referee is Mark Edwards from County Durham. It's his fifth season as an EFL referee. Uh, last season, he handed out 85 yellows and one red card in 27 games. The last United game he took charge of was the 2-0 win over Grimsby Town. Uh, back in March this year, the only player booked that day was Paul Huntington. Head-to-head, 18th meeting between the two sides, Mike. Not a single draw <laughs> in those games. That's I've said it now. That, that's something else, isn't it? I, yeah, I, no, that I, is good. Well, you say I've said it now. I'll bloody take a draw right now. That's what I'm gonna. Yeah, not giving away my predi- Not giving away my prediction yet, but I, I would take mm. a draw now. Um, seven wins for United and uh, ten for the Latics. Um, on to United then, Mike. Um, what are we thinking for this one? Um, well, obviously back 
Well, no, Bat probably can't play, can he? Uh, You'd imagine Alex. Ellis. I think Ellis might come in for back for this one just because yeah. simply the fact that, like I said, I felt like he was in the second half just playing within himself a little bit and it was kind of like, okay, that that's where we are with that at the moment. I think Ellis is a little bit uh, more defensive-minded as well, which maybe yeah. wouldn't be the worst thing in the world for this game. No, no, um, no. I'd imagine Arm would still play on the left, though. Um, yeah. Mellish would play left centre. The rest, I, I would start Barkley at right centre. And yeah. I would maybe start Lavelle in the middle. I think Saturday, Tuesday for Huntington could be a bit of a struggle. Well, he got subbed off in this one, didn't he, Huntington? Mm. Um, for Was it for Butterworth, actually, wasn't it? So with 20 minutes to go, which I, I felt like, oh, maybe he's resting him for Tuesday night here. Maybe mm. he's keeping him fresh so he can actually play Tuesday. He had a great game, Huntington, up until the goal. And just before the goal, he made a mistake as well. But bar that, he was excellent. He was winning all the, nipping in, winning the ball, some great tackles. But it kind of felt like a bit, oof, second half was catching up on him a little bit. So Wigan's a big game. You know, yeah, I feel like you need someone like Huntington up against Charlie Wyke. I really do. Wyke, Wyke's never been the most mobile striker, is he? I'm not saying he's slow, but he's mm. not pacey, is he? So I, I think Huntington should be able to cope with him fairly well and let the other players around him deal with the rest of them. Hate, yeah, maybe. just depends on his legs, really. Um, we'll have to see. Um, midfield? But, uh, midfield, see, we're a little bit limited with injuries. I'm not convinced Moxton would be ready for this one. I, I think uh, McGeek is not going to be available, is he? That's no, McGeek isn't going to be that. playing either. Uh, so for me, I'd probably have a guy sitting deepest. Um, and do you know what? We touched on it before. I'd maybe give Jaden Harris a go. Mm. Sort of in the middle, maybe playing a bit box to box, running about, yeah. and uh, I'd play Gibson on the right in that role right. I was on about before. Okay, and and then up, up front again, Maguire. I'm not sure his family issues would be resolved uh, by now. Um, but I'd start Edmondson, yeah. um, and and maybe start Butterworth. You know, okay, you go Butterworth. Mm. Interesting. I. I'd... I'm touch and go with I start Garner in this one alongside Edmondson mm. because I feel like in one sense it would be a game you'd be really up for but in another sense it would be a game you'd be really up for um, <laughs> and that's, that's what worries me that it's against his former club and you know mm. what he's like with that you know he, he was like he was like that against us a couple of times wasn't he he, he mm. could be a little nasty piece of work and ah uh, yeah I'm very much mm, what's he do with this one I don't know I, I'm I'm undecided I think if Moxon is close to being fit, then I, I would start him in this one, 100%. I'd maybe be prepared to sub him off, second half, but I'd be starting him. And with you, though, I'd be tempted to have Harris involved, maybe, if he isn't. I, I feel like maybe a bit of physicality in there would be good. Mm. And, yeah, I think I'd drop McCallman and put Gibson into that midfield role and try... Ideally, I think Gibson, Guy and Moxon, back to what we had at the start of last season, that midfield was very dynamic, and I think we could do with that a little bit at the moment. Yeah. I really, really but do. I don't think the personnel we have available, like sort of Guy and Moxon sat a bit deeper, didn't they? And we had Gibson at more yeah. as a 10. I think the personnel available, we don't really have two players that I'd see sit, sitting deeper. No, no, it, 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 it's a tough one. Um, yeah, it, 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 I don't know. I, I feel like the, the defence more or less picks itself with back of the out for Ellis, we're presuming. Mm. But, the rest, I think only Guy really justifies starting at the moment. You know, at the moment, yeah. from midfield to attack, he's the only one who really just nailed down that place. And yeah, yeah. the rest of them, you could pick anyone really. Maybe Gibson, but again, Gibson not as an attacker. So he'd have to be in midfield for me. But mm. hey. right then, um, on to the predictions then, Mike. Um, the scores are still the same. It's just me on one point so far. And that's it from Moxon's goals. The only one that's given us a point uh, to date. What are you going for for this? I'm going to be positive and I'm going to go for a 1 0 win. And I'm going to go a goal from Sam Lavelle. Oh, okay, Sam Lavelle, mm. 1 0. Uh, I said 1 1 on the Wigan podcast with them when I had a chat with them. I'm going to stick with 1 1. I said Joe Garner on that goal scorer. I'm going to change it up on this one, and I'm going to say a goal from. Uh, do I go Ryan Edmondson or do I go somewhere? Ryan Edmondson? Go on, Ryan Edmondson's going to get the goal in a one-one draw. Is what I'm going for. Right, let's have Dan's prediction. Uh, 
first proper test, I think, this on Tuesday night against Wigan. Uh, they are essentially a championship team who got relegated because of points deductions and off-field troubles. Uh, they've had a great start to the season. Uh, good comeback win at home against Northampton on Saturday. That shows uh, the mark of a team that knows what it's doing. Uh, Charlie White played well first game, couple of goals. Uh, I'd I'd be happy with a point at home. And if we could follow it up with a win on the Saturday, that'd be brilliant. So I'm going to go for a one-all draw and I'm going to go for Luke Plange to score. <laughs> Has he been on the mushrooms? <laughs> Luke Plange. To score. Well, you know what? If he's right, he can come yeah. on in midweek and he can crow about it. He's like, every right to crow about it. If he's wrong, then frankly, he's going to get reminded, you predicted Luke Plange to score against Wigan. But yeah, no, fair play. Fair play. That's, yeah. that's Dan prediction. Everyone's entitled to their own view on this. Right, before we do the XFL section, let's have the answer to Dan's question. The question was, uh, Diaz, the Wigan player, scored a winner against Carlisle, but not for Wigan. Who was it he scored the goal for? Izzy Diaz scored the winner for Rochdale in a 1 0 win up at Brunton Park in August 1998. Well, there you go. I, I, that was completely <laughs> wrong. Uh, it was Rochdale, not Walsall. I'm sure he played for Walsall. Maybe it was Martin who played for them or the other fellow. I don't know. Someone played for Walsall, anyway, I'm sure, one of those ones. But there you go. Well, there yeah, you I go. think Martin has played for Walsall with Zegor, I think. Oh, maybe you're right. That rings a bell. Yeah, well, there you go. Um, yep, so that's the uh, Dan's question out of the way. Let's get on to the X-Files section. Not too busy, this one, but some interesting ones in there. Uh, Ashton Addison, he's had a great start to life for Chillingham, hasn't he? It's mm. a really smart move for him, that, I think, it's fair to say. He scored the only goal as Chillingham beat Accrington Stanley 1-0 at home. That's two 1-0 wins to start the season for Chillingham. I I I think they'll be top three at the end of the season at level. I really do. They'll certainly be up there. Yeah, they 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 just seem to have signed really well in the summer. They'd already signed quite well in January, haven't they? And they they're just building something there. I think it's fair to say. Jamie Proctor scored on his debut for Barrow as they beat Sutton United two one at Holker Street. Two wins out of two for Barrow. Can they get up to League One as well? No. All right. Okay. Fair 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 enough. Straightforward there. Um, this is a lovely one. Brennan Dickinson. Two goals for Oldham as they be, be at, they hammered Aldershot Town 5-1 in this one. Brilliant result that, isn't it, really? I saw, I saw one of them. One of them was an absolute cracker. 30, 30 yards, wasn't it? Smashed it. Yeah. Brilliant, brilliant effort. I, I'm so pleased for him because he, he had a horrible time with us in terms of injuries, wasn't mm. he, really? And he's one of those ones we expected big, big things of and it just never quite worked out, did it? You know, that first season was terrible in mm. terms of injuries. The second one... It's just we were a crap side, but he, mm. he got some important goals and some important moments that season. You know, that point we got against Scunthorpe, you know, where we mm. if we'd lost that one, that could have really dented our confidence early on. Yeah, um, yeah uh, great stuff for Brennan. Uh, Nick Ballardo, obviously recently signed for Stockport County, but I think he's on a dual registration with FC United. So he uh, he scored in his debut for them as they beat Worksop Town at 3 0 um, in Workington's division, that isn't it? And Workington, what a start to the season they had. 5-0 mm. win of Ashton United. So top of the league after one game. Uh, just a piece of cake for Danny Granger at the level, isn't it? Yeah, and, and And could be even easier if the rumours about their future signing is true. Have you heard this one? Uh, well, I've heard a couple, yeah. Jamie Devitt, allegedly, is yeah. one that's been linked with them. That's the rumour that apparently they're, they're waiting to spend this uh, transfer booster money they've got on uh, bringing Jamie Devitt. And obviously they've got to wait for him to get fit again. But mm. I mean, he's one of those ones where you wouldn't even have to play him every weekend, would you? You just tell him like Tuesday nights, don't bother, you're okay. You but he, he, even then, no, I, he wouldn't even have to run at that level. I think he could just stand in the centre circle, pinging the ball about and he'd, he'd be class. I mean, they've got. I mean, they've already got Dav Simon who's a pretty good set PC taker and mm. so is Connor Tinian. So have him as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, some 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 setup they'll have there, won't it? Yeah. Uh, uh, finally, in the stuff from the weekend, uh, well, in terms of goals and cards, Nathan Thomas not a great start for him at Mask United. He was sent off on his debut for them. <sighs> not a great way to go, is it? Uh, yeah. Some other little bits and pieces from the weekend, though. Uh, Morgan Bacon he made his debut for Chatterton as they beat Berry three one in front of a crowd of four thousand one hundred fifteen in the Northwest Counties League. That's some crowd, isn't it, really? We're not yeah, great stuff. And Berry, and Berry have signed a lot of players from the division above who were top scorers last season and things mm. like that. And 
not quite the start they would have hoped for that. Uh, I know John McGee is uh, listening to the pod. He, he went to that game because he, he sent us that a bit, little bit of information. So thank you, John, for that. Uh, J.K. Gordon was named on the bench for Crystal Palace in their 1-0 win at Sheffield United. Didn't come off the bench. They only made one sub, which was James Tompkins in injury time. So they were quite happy with the team for all of that game. But yeah, re- nice to say. I think it's fair to say he's probably out of our reach now, would you say? I don't know. I mean... I think because they're allowed more subs now, Premier League teams, aren't they? Yeah, I've, I think they've always been allowed quite a few more. But it, I think the fact that he's even involved in them suggests that they they, they quite like what they see with him. So, yeah. I, 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 I know he's been linked. It might be one that we might get to revisit in January if it's not getting game time and stuff. Maybe, maybe, maybe. I don't know. I would do a nice little swap for Luke Plunge. I wouldn't be able to do this by I'm being harsh there. Sorry. Uh, and finally, and this is a belter. This is one that Dan's uh, found. 47-year-old Richard Prokas named on the bench for Penrith this weekend. That's impressive, isn't it? Yeah, what a man. <laughs> I, I mean, like, I know it's like the, pretty much the lowest level of uh, non-league football, isn't it? Or maybe one above that. Mm. But, um, yeah, some some going really that, isn't it, to be to be still playing at 47. Yeah. Um, he's assistant manager, isn't he, I think, to Darren Edmondson there. So I think that's the reason why. Probably filling a space on the bench as much as anything. I think but, he was manager a few years ago, wasn't he? I think he briefly had a little spell at man- as manager, yeah, yeah. but it, it didn't quite work out. But there you go. Uh, right, well, that's it. Mike, we're at the end of the episode. Thanks very yep. much for joining me, talking about all Cheers. things the Blues again. Um, thank you once again to our sponsors, the London Bunch, for their brilliant support this season. If you want to get in contact with us, you can uh, find us on Twitter, at Brunton Bugle. Same on Instagram. We're also on Facebook. We don't update the Facebook and Instagram page as much as we should. We're going to try and start doing that a bit more this season. But um, yeah, if you go on there and just drop us a message or whatever, we try and respond as much as we can. Also, you can email us, bruntonbugle at gmail.com. We always welcome in your comments or any questions you've got, maybe. It'd be a nice little thing to do if you send in questions. We'll try and answer them on the pod. Uh, and and yeah, obviously, if you want to subscribe, go to any good podcast app, search for Brunton Bugle, click subscribe, and anytime a new episode comes out, you'll get a little alert to let you know, and you can download and listen to it at your leisure. Uh, you can also find us on bruntonbugle.com as well if you want to listen to the episodes there. Uh, upcoming episodes, we'll be doing a preview for the Exeter game uh, later in the week, and obviously then we'll have the uh, Port Vale uh, game coming up at the end of the month as well. And that's it, Mike, isn't it? So yeah. Hopefully, hopefully we can somehow spring a little bit of an upset on Tuesday night against Wigan. That's what we're really hoping for, aren't we? Yeah, definitely. But we'll have to wait and see. Thanks everyone for listening and up the blues. Up the blues. Every time you play.